Hey, what's going on everybody? It's episode 200. I'm Jeremy, broadcasting, do I get to use that word? Live streaming from my home, which if you follow carefully, is also hey, Whistlekick headquarters. What's going on everybody? It's episode 200. I'm lucky enough to have this massive broadcasting. Do I get to garage use that, that became the warehouse. From and my so home. if you listen to the show or you order product, well, not so much now, but if you did at some point, it was from here. So I'm really excited to bring you episode 200 from the comfort of my own home, so to speak. Of course, for comfort, I decided to sit in my grandfather's rocking chair, which is not the most comfortable seat I have, but, you know, it'll force me to sit up, sit upright and poised and, and all of that. Comfort of my own home. It's a little odd for me to be doing this live. I'm not always the most comfortable to doing these things live, but you know what? I wanted to do something special because it is episode 200, so... That's what we're doing. We're going live. And it's before we go any further, I, I really need to thank somebody. The person that you're going to hear from and see a, a bit as we go through this show, this this three-hour monstrosity, uh, my friend Sean. So, Sean, I can't see what, what you're showing, but hopefully you're going to hear from and see a bit as we go through this show. Uh, who you are and your three-hour monstrosity. I've gotten to know Sean through martial arts, of course. My friend Sean. Sean. Train, so, my friend, Sean, Sean, I can't see what, what you're showing, but hopefully you're going to hear from and see a bit as we is, go through uh, this show. Who you are in, in your three-hour monstrosity. Uh, gotten to know uh, Sean through martial, martial arts, arts, of course. Yeah. My friend Sean. We've built a friendship. Sean, I can't see what you're showing, but hopefully you're going to hear from and see a bit as we go through this show. Who you are in your three-hour monstrosity. Gotten to know Sean through martial arts, of course. My friend Sean, we've built a friendship. That's it. Sean, I can't see what, what you're showing, but hopefully you're going to hear from and see me a bit as we go through this show. Who you are is a real monstrosity. Gotten to know Sean through martial arts, of course. My friend Sean, we've built a friendship. That's it. Sean, I can't see what what you're showing, but hopefully you're going to hear from and see me a bit as we go through this show. Who you are is a real monstrosity. Gotten to know Sean through martial arts, of course. My friend Sean, we've built a friendship. That's it. Sean, I can't see what what you're showing, but I've received a lot of feedback from people who say that they want to see more of me, hear more of me. I can't see what you're showing, but not because of my own ego. In fact, I get a little uncomfortable talking about myself and, and being this, this this much out there. Terrible grammar, but you know what I mean. Not because of but this is what people have asked for, so this is what we're doing. Episode 100 was my interview because that's what people ask for. I am more than happy to be the person on the other side of the mic, on the other side of the table. The role Sean is so kindly filling this evening. But this is your show. Whistlekick may be my company, but Martial Arts Radio is your show, and I'm happy to have all of you listening and have all of your support. I'm going to shout out and do a couple things right now but Sean what I'd love for you to do since we're a few minutes in if you could just go double check your phone and make sure the audio is coming through I did a test earlier but it would be cool just just to quadruple check all that because the last thing I want is for people to have to just stare at me um, miming things and, and have them read my lips because I slur so you may not understand what I'm saying hey I hear my voice cool it's working awesome okay um, what is on my agenda? I'm not going to go through the whole thing because there's a lot of stuff here. And it's really, it's really small type. Okay. Hey, I hear my voice. Cool. It's working. Awesome. Can you mute that now, Sean? Hearing my own voice on, on delay is actually really distracting. <laughs> okay. The first thing that I want to bring up. Okay. If you want to engage with the show, there's a couple ways we can do that. First off, email me. We've got a, another computer set up with the ability to print. So if you email in okay. Jeremy at Whistlekick.com, J-E-R-E-M-Y at Whistlekick.com. Honestly, if you email anything on Whistlekick.com, it's going to end up at that address. So that's cool. Go ahead, email in. Um, we're not going to be able to monitor all the social media accounts today. Just there, There's too much going on. I'm already asking Sean to do a lot. I want this to be your show. I want to know what you think. I want to hear your stories. I want to hear your questions. Much of what we're going to do today is based on questions, comments, feedback that have come in over the last few weeks. If you're watching, you've probably seen that 
years. I've been asking for that commentary over the last, much of honestly, two months. And a lot of you have been kind enough to write things in, so thank you for that. But this is your opportunity, if you haven't done that, to do it now. Excuse me, write in. Now, one other thing that we can do, if you want to be on the show, voice-wise, we're going to go really old school. The phone is ready. So what you can do is I will have... I'll ask you to email in and say why you want to come on the show, who you are, you know, what you want to talk about. And you know, we're not going to improve all those, and we'll probably just do a few of them if people even want to. But uh, we can do that. So go ahead, email in. And, and Sean, if somebody does write in that they want to go on the show, um, why don't you print that out for me so I can look? Because you know what? I'm going to be honest. If I don't know who you are, I'm probably not putting you on the show. In voice because this is live there's no opportunity if someone starts swearing up a storm why am i nervous about that what i don't know who you are but somebody had said that it's repeating but i'm not sure if this is live there's no what is repeating oh okay i'm did it look fine when you looked at it on your phone it did it sounded fine then we're good i'm not i might be repeating things because i mumble and ramble but if someone's listened to anything over the last 200 episodes, oh, they know okay. that I do that. And they just, just get used to it. it, on your phone? it Broke my train of thought, though. Where was I going? I might be repeating. I don't know. If you want to be on the show in voice, we can do that. But if someone's listened All right. To anything, Where am I in my schedule? I got stuff going on. What do you want to know about me? You can write in about that. We've got a we've got a lot of questions. In fact, Sean and I sat down a couple times and we talked a lot about what it's like to be a listener, to to kind of be on the other side and not know stuff about me and, and the questions that people might have. So we got a bunch of those. We've got a, we've got a lot of questions. In fact, Sean and I sat down a couple times. There's a feedback loop that's not too distracting. What it's like to be a listener, to kind of be on the other side and not know stuff about me and the questions that people might have. So we got a bunch of those. I wonder where that's coming from. There's a feedback did you, you didn't hear that on your phone? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you why don't you check? Like, go down the other end of the house and just and just double check and and we'll see. You know, this this is what happens when you when you bootstrap stuff. And I'm I hope you guys are all cool with that because this is how we roll. It's simple. This thing is set up. I I, I don't know, I can't show you. It would be some weird MC Escher thing. But this is what happens it's, when it's, you there's a laptop and a webcam. And this thing is set up. I'm hearing my own voice. Yeah, go mute it before you come back, <laughs> please. Um, yeah, if if you could see it, it's just it's really simple. It's a it's a webcam on a tripod. Uh, I'm hearing and, my own voice. And then there's the Instagram yeah, go, live. Mute which, it before you come back. Um, I think I forgot to start that. So I'm gonna start the Instagram live right now. Hold on. Yeah, if if you could see it, it's just it's really simple. It's a Webcam on a tripod. And then Um I think I forgot to start that. So I'm gonna start the Instagram live right now. Hold on. Yeah, if you if you could see it. And hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Can you make sure that shot is framed on the phone, please, for Instagram? Um that's gonna go down every hour, so just watch that and you'll have to restart it. Or I'll restart it. I don't know. This is okay. this is budget right here. This is. Can you make sure that shot is framed? I started the show with a twenty-five dollar Logitech headset. Every hour, so and if you go back and you listen to the first, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 episodes, which we're actually in the process of cleaning up now, you will hear the difference between then and now. Maybe not so much today, but upgraded to a big, fancy mic. And if you go back and you listen to the first, it's, like it's huge. It looks like it belongs in a recording studio. I feel like I'm I'm recording for Dr. Dre every time I do an episode. It's cool. Um, the other thing, the other thought that came in that people were, were looking to have incorporated was the idea of having me look at something and offer some technical commentary, uh, how to, how to fix, you know, what's my sidekick doesn't work or something like that. And you're welcome to do that. Um, I don't, we're not gonna be able to show those videos, which kind of makes that, that idea kind of lame. Um, how to fix, so what's. Do that, but it just won't be part of the show, and I'll, I'll just respond to you. Because you're welcome to do that. I write back to everyone that writes in because the show is still small enough that I get to do that, and that's really cool. I love it. All right. Um, next thing. So, 
If you go to whistlekick.com, and you can do that right now, you can do that anytime between now and honestly when I wake up tomorrow, because by the time right. the show ends at 11 o'clock my time, I'm going to be exhausted Next thing. and pass out. So, you will see. If you go oh, to whistlecake.com. So, and you can do that right um, now, you can do that anytime between now there's and There's no color contrast. Here we go. Color contrast. You will see a spot for this bracelet. Now, you're going to think that this is Jeremy being all commercial and, and trying to sell you things, and sort of. But let me tell you why. Let me tell you why I'm wearing this, this bracelet, cuff, whatever people call it. Um, so I am friends with this woman named Alex, Alexandra, Alexandra Barron, and she is a local artist who does these really, really cool designs out of upcycled, aka reused, bicycle inner tubes, and I've gotten to know her mostly through her husband Hans, who's done some of the photographs for Whistlekick, and he's become a good friend. You know, they're, they're both great people, and I reached out to Alex and I said, hey, can we do something kind of in... Gotten to know her mostly through her. There's an echo. Did you hear it in your? For whistle kick. And okay. He's um. So this is. Is your is your mic so muted? Mic is muted. There are two going: a desktop up, desktop audio and a mobile echo. desk mic. Did you hear it in your? Desk. Desktop audio is okay. the um. Is, is the headphone your, jack. Is your, okay. Um, you know what? Mic. Try try plugging the headphones back in. Okay. See see if that and and see if that fixes the the echo. Desktop okay. audio is... Um, I spent about six, seven hours prepping for this today, but there was only so much that I could test okay. um, for the live try, stuff. Try, try plugging the headphones back in. See, <laughs> see if that, and, and see if that it, that's coming out through there. The echo. Um, why don't you go ahead and mute that? I spent about Just six, go ahead and mute desktop audio. Today, but there was only because when those headphones aren't plugged in, the live stuff. Try, try are you hearing it? There's a second playback coming from somewhere. That's coming out through there. The echo. Um, you can hear oh, it. you know where it is? Just it's because it's running audio. in the Facebook page when those headphones on Chrome. Again, if you, it, op you it? open up the Chrome tab and you, you'll yeah. probably see it and then just mute the speakers or mute the playback on there. Oh, you know where it is? It's because it's running in the Facebook page on Chrome. If you, it, Do you see it? Open up the Chrome okay, hold on. You'll probably see it and then just mute the Look at the hat. Mute the playback on there. Did that kill it? All right, so we're testing. We think we got it. Hopefully we got it and that there's no more echoey, echoness. Sean's unsure. Hmm? I can hear it on that. Oh. It. Right, well, you can unmute it. Okay, so anyway, so this cuff. <laughs> I reached out to Alex and I was like, hey, can we, can we do something? Can we do something to celebrate episode 200 and, and whatnot? Because this is a big deal. Most podcasts, if you don't know, I know a lot of people that are, are watching right now are friends or you know, Facebook fans. I really hate that term, but they don't listen to the podcast routinely. Most podcasts don't get beyond episode 10. To get, beyond, to, get to episode 200 is, is a big deal. Not because it means you have any amount of listeners. It just means that you're willing to be persistent. And that if, if you know me, you know that I'm persistent. And we got it. Okay, hey, so the 15 years I spent in IT came in handy for right now. So awesome. <laughs> Go to whistlekick.com. Check out Alex's design. And it's $10 off for the length of the show. They will be made to order. Um... I think we're doing seven and a half inches, whatever it says up there. By default, we can make them whatever length. So just put that in the comments when you order and, and we'll adjust it. And those will happen in the next couple of weeks. They'll get mailed out for free. And, you know, um, I'm not going to make any money on those. So it's we're not doing it for that. We wanted to do something limited edition. And, and I'll even say right now, any of the profit that comes in on that, I'll just donate it to something. So, Sean, Sean's making a big, big broad gesture. What? What's going on? So we got our, we got our first email, Jeremy. We got an email already? We do. Hold on. Let me, am I done talking about Alex's bracelet? I guess so. Yeah, she's a really cool artist, so go to whistlekick.com. I linked her website from there. She does these absolutely amazing, um, I don't wear them because I wear very simple earrings, but she does these very beautiful uh, feathered earrings and I, I know probably half a dozen if not more women 
in the area that have them and they love them. So you should check those out too. And no, Alex is not paying for this pitch. I just think she's talented and I love ta partnering with talented people. All right. Um, is it is it like a question that you're going to read or is it something you're going to print? Is All it... right, so it is something, the question that came in via yeah. email is something that is on the agenda. Oh, okay. Well, then then don't worry about it. Okay. So thank you, person that wrote in. We will get to your question. It was uh, Heather Connelly. Oh, hi, Heather. Heather is one of my best friends and my chiropractor, and she's cool. So thanks. All right. I think that's all the, the shout stuff that we need. Is your phone still running? Yeah, okay. So, I, um, you know, checking that periodically isn't a bad idea, but just mute it when you're done because I don't know, I don't know about anybody else, but hearing your voice is one of the most distracting things on earth. Um, I had a very, very super extremely brief uh, recording career. It was like one day. And uh, I, I couldn't deal. <laughs> I couldn't deal listening to my stuff as it came back through. All right. Um, so we got there. And I, and I heard somebody come in. I got a feeling I know who it is. So, hey, what's going on, Dan? All right. Um, I don't know Dan, but I know Dan has a bag in his hands. Dan does have a bag in his hands. And, and here's, here's the challenge. This is, this is a three-hour show. Uh, do you know where the glasses are? Oh, uh, you'll find them. You'll find them. Uh, there's a corkscrew around there, too. If people are going to feed me drinks, just please make sure there's not a whole lot, because i got three hours to do. <laughs> um, Jeremy, Yeah. I've got a one-drink limit. You've got a one-drink limit? You, I'm not going to monitor you. Wonderful. Thank you. you, you i got enough to worry about. I can't monitor your consumption. i got to monitor my own. i got to make sure all this stuff's happening and that I'm speaking moderately intelligibly here's a fact i've never recorded the show drunk maybe buzzed like once but it's really distracting in college i used to tell myself i can have a beer and then write a paper and it, i would have more than one beer and write zero papers all right first thing i want to talk about is my my path through the martial arts. And, and let's kind of recap. Let's go back like the when and the where. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the highlights because people ask this question a lot. And honestly, it, it surprises me because I don't find it that interesting, but other people do. And maybe that's for the same reason that it's the first question I ask on on the show, on, on the interview shows. You know, when did you start doing martial arts? So I started doing martial arts when I was four. It was 1983. Yes, I was born in 79. I just had my birthday, June 8th. There, now you can steal my identity. Uh, and I started karate. I started at a small school. I was there on the first day of the school in a little town, Casco, Maine. Bushido Karate Dojo is what it was called. It's actually still called that, even though uh, new instructors, new owners, and, and all that. Uh, I hang out with those folks still once in a while, which is really cool. But the school was kind of interesting because you had had a husband and wife and the husband was Ishinru and the wife was Kyokushin Kai and so we had two sets of, of forms kata and we had two different ways of looking at things and I was blessed because they were very open and they encouraged us to gather information from wherever we could and we would have guest instructors and I really liked that. I was there until I went to college. I had earned my black belt before that time and started training. Everything should be good with that. With the Instagram feed. Camera offline for 10 minutes. Oh. Um, I'm off. Yeah. Hold up. Because I'm guessing... I'm guessing that that happens because the screen is turning off. And apologies to everyone that's trying to watch on Instagram. You're still showing on live on the phone with me here. Yeah, that's Facebook. Facebook's cool. We're good with Facebook. Uh, sleep. Sleep after 30 seconds of inactivity. Okay. So every like 20 minutes, you got to do something on here. How's that? Okay. Instagram. We're back to Instagram. And we do that. And we go to live. And we say start live video. And it's going. Okay. So I go to college. And I go to college and 
I was like, hey, I want to do some martial arts. And there was a karate club on campus, and it was this kind of loose uh, version of Shotokan with a completely different name. And they didn't want to admit that they were Shotokan, but they were Shotokan. They were Shotokan karate. So I did that for like a year and a half um, until one of the junior instructors, who was older than me, um, decided on a day where my knee was bothering me that he was going to kick out my stance, you know, to, to get me to lengthen my stance. Um, even though I had told him that my knee was bothering me and he decided that was a cool thing to do. And that was the last time I went because yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not about that. Uh, there was a Capoeira club that had just started on campus. So I was playing with those guys. I did that for a couple years. And then I finally got a car and I got to train with a gentleman who has been on the show, someone that I look up to tremendously. Uh, then Sensei now, Shihan Wayne Mello, episode, episode six. Uh, shout out to Shihan Mello, one of my favorite people, one of my favorite martial artists on earth, and just someone who I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for. So I was able to drive over and train with him and work my way up to Brown Belt, uh, and then graduated college, moved to Vermont, opened my own school for a couple years, but I was building an IT company, and I don't know if anybody's taught routinely taught you know sort of in the intense way that you might in having your own school you know two kids classes two adult classes each week for you know what we're doing four five hours yeah five hours of class a week after you know working 12 hour days yeah i was working that hard i didn't have anything left and it didn't feel fair to my students so i shut down the school and i kind of languished for a couple of years, trained on my own a bit, and hung out with some martial arts friends. And then I said, you know what? I need an instructor. Looked in this tiny little town. There were two Taekwondo schools. Randomly picked one of them. And that is still where I, I train primarily now with Master Randy Rota, who has been, you know, such a wonderful man, a wonderful supporter of of me, of my training, of whistle kick and, and thank you to him. And that's where I've been since 2006, seven, something like that. So that's it. So that's that's my background. That's my question one. And if you've listened to episode 100, you might remember some of that. If you haven't, if you, after this three hour marathon, if you want to know more about me, you can check out episode 100 and you can hear all about that. And actually, Mr. Hartz, Daniel, who is in the other room now, popping the cork on a bottle of champagne. Uh, he was the one that interviewed me. He's been a good friend. So shout out to Dan, <laughs> who just had a baby. Hey, Jeremy, I'm going to ask you something. Um, yeah. I know you got this a little bit on the agenda, but I want to yeah. uh, make it specific. Thanks, bud. I want to know how you got involved with uh, Bill Super Pope Wallace. 200. Cheers. 200. Uh, how did I get involved with Bill Wallace? So... Back in, uh, what would that have been? That would have been like the spring of uh, two, 20, 2015. Right about the time this show, yeah, put that anywhere. Right about the time this show was starting, I was approached by my friend, Master Hughes and Alexander, who was episode one. And he said, hey, um, we should do this Superfoot seminar at my school. You know, we can collaborate on it and we can we can bring him in and, and I was like, yeah. So I went and I met him and and you know that was a, a really fun day. And then excuse me. Um got to record with him for episode fourteen. Ooh, I'm usually better than this. I believe so. Fourteen. And after that, you know, just really spent a lot of time with promotion. And anybody that came to that event knows that we kind of blew the doors off. We had, between the kids and the adult seminar, we had 100 people, which is more than typically show up to a Superfoot seminar. Just a testament to the reach of Whistlekick uh, or my own insanity and in, in beating people over the head to get them to show up. But I spent that whole day working. So I didn't get to train. I was, I was taking photos. I was checking people in. I was making sure people had what they needed. And from there, I just, I got bummed out. I was like, hey, um, I'm not getting to play. So I reached out to uh, 
uh, one of his students, Master Terry Dow, who has been on the show, and oh, I don't remember when that one is. Um, early, within the first 30, definitely. Who lives in Manchester, New Hampshire, is about two and a half hours away. Uh, Bill Wallace lives in Florida. And I said, hey, I didn't get to do anything. Can I come hang out? Can you, can you like, give me the basics? Can we just spend an hour together? And he said, yeah, sure, come on down. So we set up a day, and I drove down, and I show up, and about 30 minutes in to this, to going over this Superfoot stuff, he says, you have pretty good kicks. So I was like, hey, thanks. You know, it's a, quite the compliment coming from, from somebody like you. And he says, you know, and this is like December of 2015. He says, you know, I would like to put you up for promotion for Black Belt under Grandmaster Wallace. And I was like, uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, what does that entail? And he told me, we talked about it a lot and set up a time for me to come back because obviously I was going to need a lot more training so I could, you know, learn the ins and outs of that system. And short version, I ended up hanging out with those guys and earning my black belt. And those of you that may have seen some, some photos recently, uh, beginning of the month, I was in Alabama and passed my second degree black belt test under Bill Wallace and it's just it it's an incredible group of people and I've really enjoyed getting to work with them and getting to know them and you know at, at our annual conferences you know there's a lot of sharing it's not just superfoot kickboxing stuff it's martial arts and uh, I, I got the opportunity to see Grimmaster Wallace who honestly his first love is not kickboxing it's it's judo it's wrestling and I got to see him work some of that stuff with uh, another past guest, Sheehan Grant Campbell, who I, I really enjoyed working with. So um, that's does, does that Sean? Does that answer your question about? Uh, yes, about very much so. And um, you can get to the testing as you have it listed later. Um, we have yeah. our first question. Um, it actually, comes from Dan, who's a guest in this in house. And um, this question is: Who's giving me booze? <laughs> you guys well, aren't allowed to get me drunk. I just, no, I just no, want, so I just want to say that this is a celebration, and no, I thought so about getting cider, uh, dirty mayor, mm. the, the ginger cider, mm. and All there's right. a. There's do you a... want to get Dan out there? Uh, do you want to show his face? Do you want to go out there Dan, for a second? Do, do you, you want to come on? There's a. There's a chair. I wore the right shirt. Yeah. You can ask your question to Jeremy instead of having me. Grab that chair and come and come sit, and you can ask the question, and we can put you on the spot here. Yeah, put me on the spot. I mean, if I don't want to answer your question, I'll just, I don't know, not. Deal with it. Uh, pull it a little tighter. There we go. That I just didn't want to block the logo. <laughs> so, the logo's on your shirt. Oh, it's true. And it's on my shirt. I'm replacing it with a better one. That's right. So, <laughs> so tell us about your most embarrassing martial arts story. <laughs> Hold on. That, might, you, that I, might take a second. I listen to your yeah. podcast every week, and I'm like... He always says best martial arts story, and we get some really great stories out of people. And I'm like, the best ones aren't necessarily the ones that people always want to share. <laughs> and really, some of the embarrassing okay. ones can end up being some of the best. All right, stories. here's one, and this is one that I, I I don't think I've ever talked about on the show. So I mentioned this this karate club that I'm hanging out with my freshman year of college, and I'd been there like six weeks, you know, and and I'm stepping in with. 14 years of experience, which is more than anybody else that's in the, in the club, um, more than the instructors. And it's not that that meant I should be in charge or anything. I'm not trying to say it like that. It just meant there was, there was an, a, a, a vibe that I knew what I was doing. Because in theory, I knew what I was doing. But I was more than happy to put on a white belt, just as I have with, with your school, with Sensei Earl. Shut up, Sensei Earl. Um... But I'm wearing a white belt and I'm sparring with this black belt and we're, we're doing some, some kind of pseudo point sparring. I don't think we had gear on and we, we probably kicked it up a notch more than we, we needed to because we're playing, we're having fun. You know, he was a black belt and I was a black belt. Up, we're just, into it. Yeah, yeah, we were, we were digging it and he wasn't that good. So... I was feel I don't know if I was feeling cocky about it, but I was probably feeling cocky. I was probably feeling like this guy's not that good. And you know, from the little bit that I remember, you know, I was I was scoring points on him. You know, that, that was the, the type of sparring we're doing. You know, I'm tagging him, and the next thing I know, his foot is in my face, 
And, and to this day, like I can vividly remember the foot in my face. I can't remember the kick. <laughs> I have no idea how it got there. He wasn't that fast. It just like came out of my periphery and then was in my face and it hurt. And so my hand comes to my face. I should probably not cover my face while I'm talking to the mic. My hands come to my face and I take them away and they're covered in blood. I'm like, oh, this jerk, he, he bloodied my nose and there's blood. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to go down to the locker rooms and wash. We're, you know, we're on campus. So we're on the second floor of the gymnasium in a, like a dance room or whatever. Imagine everything's blurry too. Is whenever you take one of the nose, your eyes instantly like water. It, like, it what? Like, no, my eyes weren't watering. No. I just there was just all this blood, and I was like, "This son of a gun got me!" <laughs> and not only did he get me, I'm bleeding. So nobody makes me bleed my own blood for you dodgeball fans. And so I walk down <laughs> into the locker room, and I walk up, and I, I look in the mirror, and I realize it's not coming from my nose; it's coming from my mouth. And I'm like, "Oh!" And I open my mouth to look at where, and I realize he's broken off half of my tooth. This is a crown. I've broken two <laughs> bones in my life. This finger somehow in a sparring match as a kid. And this tooth. And it was broken clean in half. And the blood is like, ah. You know, if you, if you think of like your typical gory vampire what movies. What was the blood like, Jeremy? It was like, ah. <laughs> if you think of like a, a vampire movie or something where they, they, or a zombie where they bite into a person. They come out and there's just blood through their teeth. That's what my face looked like. And I'm looking in this mirror, and I'm 18 years old, and I I've, I've, haven't had much in the way of injuries. I've never had stitches. I, I've been to the hospital once for a potential concussion and, and for my broken finger, which, I mean, that's not that big of a deal. And I'm, looking, I'm going, uh, okay. So I go to the front desk. I call my roommate who had a car. Evan, help. I'm going to the hospital. Um, the dude who broke my face drove me to the hospital. <laughs> and, and this story keeps going. Um, so I get there, and, and, and they're, they're sewing up my lip because my lip had cut on the jagged tooth I've in my face. Before. And, and that, that's where all the blood was coming from. If you've ever cut your lip deeply, it just, it's, it's all... It's just really bloody. So we, I'm getting stitched up and the doctor, the doctor's being a jerk. Like he's just, he's really being a jerk. Like not just like I'm being this whiny teenager who expects to be treated special or something, but he's being a jerk. And so he leaves the room and I, and I asked the nurse, I was like, what's going on with the doctor? Why is he a jerk? And she doesn't, there's a, there's an unhappy cat now on set. Um, so it's, a, it's fine. <laughs> this is where she decides she's going to sit right off camera. Okay. Um, so you're dealing with the jerk, the jerk of a doctor. So I'm dealing with the jerk of the doctor and he comes back in and the nurse says something to him in front of me. Mr. Lesniak wants to know why you're being such a jerk to him. And I'm like, I'm traumatized. I'm like, why, why do you need to do why? Why are you doing this? And he looks at me and he says, I was just operating on a girl who was a victim of a drive-by shooting and she died on my table. So now I'm feeling worse. You know, he's like in my face, like checking things and he's telling That'll me this story. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, and, and I'm, I'm conflicted because I'm thinking two things at the time. I'm like, uh, one, I'm embarrassed and that stinks and I'm sorry. And then... Second, um, can, can I have someone who didn't just have someone die right in front of them? Because I'm guessing that, that you're probably consumed mentally with what's going on there. And, you know, it could explain why my lip never quite healed properly. But I ended up at the dentist and they ground down what was left and they made a peg and they made a cr crown and they put it on. And so I have this one gold tooth with some porcelain on it and... Uh, I can never really fully whiten my teeth because then you can tell. So that that's the most embarrassing story that a a a, uh, uh, a poorly skilled. So dude, skill... that you think that you could just get some points on broke your face. And I have no. I still don't know how. I have no <laughs> idea how that foot got in my face.
all of a sudden it was just there things. it was there yeah yeah so is, is everything good with instagram is that running too okay hello people on instagram we've got some followers over there yay people hello people um what is not happening that was supposed to happen because it died like three seconds before um i had the big camera if anybody watched the episode where hunchy bruce jutnik interviewed grandmaster wallace at uh master terry dow's symposium in april yeah april um, I was going to have add that camera over here and it was going to video and have like the high quality feed and we were going to edit it all together and oh, I'm spilling. And uh, last minute it was like, ah, your memory card's unhappy. Like I did like seven tests and they all worked and then the eighth test just decided. So. So uh, I, yeah. I think that um, Mike Caribou finds it interesting that uh, Master Wallace's love uh, for, is for wrestling. Uh, he wrote uh, Wallace dot 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 wrestling. Yeah, yeah. So anybody that knows and and go back, listen to episode fourteen. It's actually a lot shorter than most of them, because as you might imagine, Superfoot's a busy guy. I mean, he, he's traveling all the time and he's he's doing a lot. And Demora's was short too. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, Demora's was Demora Sensei's was short because. Uh, he was tired. We, we got him after his dialysis treatment, and then he wanted to go to bed. But it's surprising how much wisdom can, they can fit into those short oh, yeah. episodes. Oh, yeah. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. And so um, in the Superfoot episode, I called him on the phone, like, basically in between things he was doing. Like, like that was the best we could do was the 20 minutes. And I was really appreciative of it. And I've been, I've been lucky to spend more time with him since then. But but I've also been able to see why he has 20 minutes because, hey, I got to turn that red light off. Although, how does that look? Is that messing with the shot at all? No, no. Because that's... You can't even see it. Uh, the Instagram, it's a little bit on the side and you can't, it's not okay. a deal. Okay. All right. Yeah, if, if you, you can just pull the cord down. Thanks. Um, when, when Mr. Wallace is with people, he's engaged with those people. Like, he's, he's never on his phone. He's just living in that moment. And if you call him... Unless it's his wife, he's probably not going to answer. So, uh, but he talks about wrestling and his and his love of wrestling and going into the army, 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 uh, and wanting to do wrestling. But there wasn't wrestling. There was judo, and he started playing judo, and he really loved judo. And then some dude fell on his knee, and then he was like, "Ah, I can't do judo." So that that's that's. The, Ah, like that, that's kind of the, that's the highlight. Like that's not the highlight. That's the, the nuts and bolts um, of that whole thing. Is that the injury that, uh, that took away the use of his? Yeah. 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 And he, he talks about that. He talks about that really openly. Uh, he even remembers what, what throw he was going for. And he remember he remembers everything. If you want to talk about a memory, that guy has everything locked I, in. I remember that from the, the couple of spots he's come in on. He doesn't just remember a person's name. He remembers where they're from. No, like, he remembers like what style they were. Everything. Like, yeah, yeah, and it's impressive. Like it you, was. you can't get anything by him. No. Um, and actually, for you know, th this is the beauty of a podcast is is that we do things and they are, um, you know, there's I mean, we've got this live component and then we've got people that are going to listen to this this week and and soon, but it'll be out there forever. So. This next part doesn't apply to the forever. So it's 2017. It's June 26, 2017. In November, uh, I know that he's going to be doing at least two seminars in New England. We've got, we're, we're a little bit New England heavy because that's where I live and that's where most of my relationships are. But he's going to be in uh, Connecticut at my friend Paul Milholland's school. And honestly, I don't even know where Paul's school is. I've been there once. Uh, and then he'll be in Manchester, New Hampshire uh, the next day, November 11th, at Master Dow's school. So if you want to know anything about those seminars or any other seminars, check out superfoot.com. It is um, periodically updated with what's going on. And, of course, if you want more details, if they're not up there, just email jeremy at whistlekick.com. I'll get you that information. So. You've had some really great guests on lately from across the pond. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know what's Ian up with that. Abernathy? Is that yeah. the same? Yeah. I really enjoyed that episode. He had some really great insight. Yeah. So what, what's funny is that I've reached out to a lot of people globally. I mean, if, if you look at who's doing martial arts 
with so you know social media who's prominent there aren't a lot of people you know you've got ian abernathy you've got jesse Ancom. let me tell you to say that with his accent he, he taught me um and then you've got a handful of others and i'm not going to name other names but you know the we are a U.S. centric show because Whistlekick is an American based company and this is where I live. So, that, you know, certainly there's a there's a bias, a cultural bias towards what's going on in America. But I'm aware of that. So I'm trying to reach out to other people. But what bums me out is that um, I've had very few no shows for the show. It's Two of them. Issue. What's that? We have a small issue over here. OK. The screen's gone to a funny color. And the video okay. is gone. Yeah, Dan does IT. Um, and we had two no-shows, and both of them were from the UK. Uh, and um, neither person responded to my inquiry about, hey, what's going on? So uh, they won't come on the show. But, you know, we've had... Um, it hasn't even happened yet, but there's a gentleman from, from Australia, uh, Mr. Ron Amram. And we've had a number of international people f that are now living in the U.S. And, and I'm just, I'm really enjoying that because that computer, all that's doing is, is to see what's going on. Like, it has no pivotal role. So if it needs to be rebooted, that's fine. Oh, so this is just, this is just watching. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's just to, like, check comments in the feed and whatever. It's, it's the backup if, if the other laptop dies. Okay. I've got most of it set up for us to stream over. Um, one of the things I love about the show is is showing how excuse me similar we are as martial artists. One of the things, if you listen to the show often, you hear me say, there are only so many ways the human body can move, and of those, only so many of them make sense in a combat setting. So if you look at what's happening from martial arts style to martial arts style, yeah, we can really drill into the nuance, but for the most part, it's the same stuff. And when we start bringing in people that are from different styles, we can see that. When we start bringing in people from different countries, we can see that. And I really like that because one of the goals here is... That are from different styles, we can see that. When we start bringing in people from different countries... That part was working. Um, we can see that we are all so much more the same. And I, and I want to end this whole, my style is better than yours crap. And if this wasn't a family show, this is the part where I would string a whole bunch of inappropriate language together because it really bothers me that much. It drives me crazy. So, yeah, a lot of international guests. All right, what else we got going on? Mm. You popping in on something? I am. Uh, okay, hey, by all means, the, the longer we go before I'm tapping into this content, the better the show will be. Yeah, one thing I was looking at is... um. The question about uh, how do I get my teens involved with martial arts? Uh, I wrote that as more teens, but the, the question would, would apply just as well there. How, how do we get teens in martial arts? Anybody that's run a martial arts school knows that you kind of have this hole. So you get kids, you know, whatever you start at, six, seven, eight, three, and, and kids come in, and then they're in, and they start to generally trickle out at like 9, 10, 11. And then somewhere between 12 and 14 in most schools, it just, it just drops. If you go to most martial arts schools, hopefully yours is different, but if you go to most, you're going to see a really big hole in that adolescent to mid-teen range. You might get some coming back in around 16, 17, but for the most part, it doesn't happen again. You don't see a, a bigger influx until mid-20s. And I can explain that really simply. Martial arts is not perceived as being cool. You're starting to see more people in those age groups taking up uh, mixed martial arts and, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because there is something representing that as cool. And that's the UFC. And you've got, excuse me, clothing brands that care about the way things look. And they're, they're trying to bring some appeal to those representations. And honestly, that's one of the big things I'm trying to do with Whistlekick. It makes me really happy I get people... Um, shooting me text messages and, and Facebook messages of people wearing our stuff, wearing the apparel in, in various places. People that I barely know messaging me with photos of people I don't know wearing whistle kick stuff. And that's like the best thing in the world. 
But it's from that realization that martial arts is not generally represented as cool. That's a big part of what's going on here at Whistle Kick that we're working to change. And one of the ways that I will be able to gauge our success is seeing more adolescents and teens staying in martial arts. We, it's, it's a big thing. It's a, it's a lofty goal that we've, I've undertaken trying to make martial arts more appealing to that age group. And obviously that's something a lot more than just, you know, some shirts and some gear and a podcast and, and the other media content that is in various stages of development now. But that's one of the goals. And there are a lot of ways that, that you can work with that now. One of them is recognizing that the way you teach a five-year-old and a 10-year-old and a 15-year-old and a 20-year-old are dramatically different. And if you've had kids those ages, you know how different they are. As an adult, it's easy to say, well, you know, this person's nine and this person's 12. It's only three years. I'm going to teach them the same way. And you can't. You absolutely cannot. That three years is tremendously vast. There's a huge separation in the way those kids are going to approach the world and, and by extension, the way they're going to approach martial arts. So you've got to teach them differently. And if you're willing to do that, then you may see some better retention. One of the things that I see some schools having success with is taking a small step back from the oh you're coming back stage you hey by yeah, all means. i got rid of the echo i think there was an echo there was another echo yeah so many echoes i just muted the speakers on that i don't know if there if there was yeah okay i didn't hear anything coming out of them but jerry i've got another question that came in um while you were speaking um it's a question from simon oh. Can you hold that question? I want to finish up with what I'm saying. Okay. And uh, because we just made a change, I'd like you to go just double check everything on your phone, please. Um, you know, whether you call it XMA or, or whatever, but just the recognition that teenagers, that, that you know, kids old enough to see things on TV and, and really engage with them and, and get the differences between martial arts in, say, like a TV show and movies and what they are generally doing as traditional martial arts. Once they hit that age, the more you can give them that, even if it's not the whole curriculum, even if it's 10 minutes out of class that reminds them of these impressive fight scenes, the more you're going to keep those kids. You know, have those kids, you know, split them up once a month, say this is fight scene night and, you know, pair them up or threes or fours or however you want to do it. And they have all class to come up with a martial arts fight scene. And that might seem... Silly, it might seem like they're not going to learn anything, but I, I would argue that so strongly. They're going to learn how to string these moves together. They're basically making a multi-person form, kata, pumse, whatever you're going to call it. And they're learning about choreography. They're learning what works and what doesn't work. I'm good right now, by all means. Um, <laughs> Sean's pouring booze. <laughs> Woo! Episode 200 every night. Yeah. <laughs> it's a party. Um but just to, to be willing to think out of the box and be creative and try to put yourself back into that space can really make a difference. And if you can keep that group, if you can keep the, let's call it the, the adolescent through teen, that 11 to 18 year old group, you're probably going to have a stronger program otherwise because the younger kids are going to look up to the teen, the older kids and if the older kids are there, they're going to be bringing an energy that is that, that is youth, youthful, not useful, youthful, that the adults are going to really enjoy being around. It can be really hard to be around teenagers, especially if you have teenagers. I don't have teenagers, but I was one once. And teenagers are jerks. But within the confines of a martial arts school, they've got to toe the line. So you can have that youthful energy with less jerkfulness. <laughs> and jerkfulness jerkfulness jerkiness jerkness jerkfulness is a cool word all right we just made up a word jerkfulness shout out to wrenchy lisa who's been making up words lately um yeah so there's some ideas there if that's not enough if people want me to go deeper on that uh you know full disclosure i'm i'm approaching that from a marketing standpoint not from the standpoint of someone who ran a big martial arts school that had a lot of adolescence I think the more connections you can make, I mean, it, it not only is it more fun, but 
you're going to lead to better retention at your school. Yeah. It's like, I think about it like a zipper. Like, you've got all these teeth in the zipper. You get the two things that you want to connect, your school and the people. Yep. And you make one connection teaching them something. You make another connection having doing something that's fun. And you just keep adding things to that zipper to make them tightly connected to your school. Right. Right. That sounds really fun, though. I really want to do that at our school now. I bet some of our kids would love to make up a fight scene. We, and <laughs> that just sounds so fun. It, it's a blast. It's something... It, it's... Making up your own forms or choreographing your own sequences is just, it's so much fun. And it's so much harder than people realize it is. You know, when you see a, a fight scene on TV or in a movie and you look at it and you're like, oh, that wouldn't work or that doesn't look good or that's not real. I will guarantee you that the worst fight choreographer in a movie is better than you are as a fight choreographer right now. Unless you are already a fight choreographer. See, I'm someone who loves... A lot of like the really old bad sci-fi fantasy like Hercules and Xena. And yeah. Where the, where the fight choreography was just so bad. It was just so bad. But I can, so I can, I can appreciate something from that all the way up to like some of my favorite fight scenes are in like the Bourne movies. Yeah. Like those well, have some inc- incredible uh, like improvised weaponry and yeah. lots of They're close quarter stuff. Fantastic. Really great stuff. I, can, I, I love it all over the board. So I'm, I'm never that naysayer. <laughs> I love, <Yeah>. I love, <laughs> yeah. But if people want more, you know, just just reach out and I'll I'll do an episode. I'll put together an outline and show notes and that whole thing. So um, I cut you off like twenty minutes ago, Sean. So pop back on. What? Uh, All what right. So doing? there was a question from Simon, um, and he wanted to know how you invented that really cool game Tether Dove. <laughs> so shout out to Master Simon Sher from Northampton, Massachusetts, who. Why don't you tell me what the game is? I yeah, no well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna what give you. What is Simon you, talking about? I'm gonna give you the context okay. of, of Simon, and then I'm gonna tell you about Tetherdo and all this other stuff because Simon and I have become good friends, and I and I really enjoy working with him on some of the projects that we've worked on. So, as with many of the guests, it comes through listener suggestions. You should talk to this person. You should talk to this person. You should talk to this person. And I got several requests, and I think actually one of them was from my, my brother Brendan, who. Just had a baby recently. Shout out to baby Ellie and Julie and Brendan. Brendan is watching. And Addison. Hey, Brendan's watching. A Hi, Brendan. white belt joins your party. <laughs> That's like three <laughs> levels of nerd right there. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. Okay. Um, now I'm distracted because that was so nerdy. Tardo. So nerdy. So um, I reach out to to Master Sure and I was like, hey, come on the show. And he's like, I don't even know what you do, but okay. So we came on the show and we're talking and come to find out he's in Northampton, Mass, which is just a couple hours away. And he mentions on the show that, you know, that question, who would you want to work with? He's like, I want to work with Bill Wallace. And it happened to be we were recording like on a Monday or Tuesday. And that Saturday I was driving down south, basically past Northampton to go to my friend Paul Milholland's school in Connecticut for a Superfoot seminar. And I was like, put your money where your mouth is. I will pick you. I will beat you at your school at this time. I will pick you up. And he was like, uh, okay. We'd never met at that point. We'd just spent a couple hours talking on the podcast. And so I picked him up and we drove and we just, we clicked. I mean, he's, he's a cool guy. We had a lot of fun. And so we... You know, we did the seminar and we drove back and we talked about working together on some stuff. And I've been down to his school a couple times. We've recorded a couple videos. And the first one that we did, hey Kim, the first one that we did was uh, a game that I sort of invented, but but he helped a lot with called Kicks. The idea of if ah, if, okay. if you remember I'm putting if, two and two together, yeah. yeah if you Simon's remember some great videos. If you remember Horse, the game of Horse, you know, like I'm gonna shoot from you know the three point line but is going to be backwards and off that guy's face. We did that with, with martial arts techniques. The idea that, you know, I'm going to throw a, a jump spinning roundhouse kick, but I've got to land in this stance and I've got to go from here to here or whatever. And so it, a few months had passed and we talked about doing another game. We kicked a few ideas around and he does a lot of balance and precision work. He's, he's just incredibly skilled with that. Somebody I really look up to. Flexibility, I mean, just... I watched his axe kick video. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, the guy is, the guy is unreal. He, yeah. He's really cool. And, and I love working with him because, it, you know, especially when we're recording on camera. 
Oh, don't what? brush your shirt. He'll posture with his hands. Oh, oh. oh. He's okay. encouraging you to be yeah. more open. Oh, more less. Thank you. See, Sean. Sean is directing and and <laughs> producing the show, so he he gets to tell us what to do. Um, unless I don't want to do it. I'll just put, keep the glass in my hand. <laughs> there you go. Um, so that's when we took the ping pong ball on a string drill that he's been using and we turned it into a game. We turned it into a lot of different variations of the game. And at the most basic level, he and I run opposite ends, kicking a ping pong ball back and forth, trying to do it in such a way that the other person couldn't respond. So you're playing ping pong with a with a ping pong ball in your feet? Yeah. No, no, you're kicking the ball. The kicking. ball is suspended from the ceiling. Suspended from the ceiling on a string. Yeah. How high above the ground? Uh, it varied depending on what we were doing. There's a whole video. I, I need to see this video. You should check out the video. <laughs> it's and I don't I feel like there were outtakes and I feel like some of those surfaced because I, I'm I'm willing I'm freely willing to admit that when it comes to holding your leg up and kicking in weird ways for a long time, he is way better at it than I am. Because he'll just, he'll go and he'll hang out at his dojang and make videos. I mean, I saw the videos. I mean, I can't imagine he does them in one take either. So he's, who knows how long he's there, like kicking his foot. Yeah, like, over so his I mean, head, he just, like, he's yeah. really good. So he's yeah. just kind of forcing me to raise the level of my game. Yeah. So you guys whisper really loudly. <laughs> You ever notice that? Like you can you can whisper or you can whisper. It's somehow it's still a whisper. Jeremy. I don't really understand that. All right. So um, shout out again to to Master Sher. Thanks for watching. Thanks for all your support for being on whatever episode you were on. I don't remember yours. There was a time, probably the first fifty episodes. I remember who was on every episode. And not only could you say a name and I could tell you the episode, I could sit down and like list them out. Because I, ha I had my, my key ones that I knew where they were, and I remembered this person was in front of this person so I could flesh out the list. It's kind of like doing, doing the states. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of like, you know, like you ever give a, a blank map of the states, and you're like, okay, I'm good up until, like, Colorado and Wyoming. And then you're like, ah, which ones? And apologies to anybody from Colorado or Wyoming. Well, they probably say that about Vermont. I had a teacher in undergrad that made us do the whole world. Oh. We do one continent at a time, but oh. he's like, if you were going to, this is like the 101 level class. It's like, if you're going to progress at all, when we're talking about current events and we're talking about a country, you need to know exactly where it is. I, I and agree. So, and so oh. it was brutal. <laughs> it was brutal while we were doing it. I'm very thankful now that it happened at the time. I was just like, oh, this That's is rough. terrible. That's yeah. super rough. Yeah. Cool. All right. Okay. How many states have you done oh. martial arts in? Sean's chiming in. Ask that oh, question. Okay, so um, we're into an hour. We're an hour into the show. Which Are we really already? One third of the way. <laughs> Ooh, right um, uh, I See, I told you. Sean was worried that we might not have enough content. He was like, what if we get through all this list, this this half a page at eight point font, and and there's still and there's and there's still like two hours left. I was like, I don't know, we'll figure it out. Okay, so a uh, question that I thought might be a little fitting that I wanted to uh, ask was um, women and grace as it relates to martial arts. Yeah. Um, I'd like to move into that. Okay. So this is a subject that's been coming up a bit uh, on the show. And, and obviously there have been a couple episodes about women in martial arts and, and where it really solidified. So um, someone is vibrating. Is that you? I'll, I'll turn that off. Yeah. That's not a big deal. Um, so if, if anybody's listened to the episode I did with Sifu James Banks talking about Donnie Yen, I think we called it Talking Donnie Yen, and that was my opportunity to speak with someone who spent some time growing up with in school and training with Donnie Yen under his mother, Sifu Baosim Mark. Um, so we did that episode, that episode aired, and I think I'm revealing this for the first time. Hey, cool. First time stuff. I was hoping some of this stuff would come up. Um, so as many of you know, the podcast goes out and then there's also uh, a, a really terrible video version, as in it's an image with the audio and that goes on YouTube because I'm not going to just record my face talking to myself because that's lame. But 
there was a comment comes through on that episode on YouTube to say, would love to get in touch with whoever's behind this so I can talk more about, so I can talk to you about my mother and brother. And I'm like, yeah, right. This is Donnie Yen's sister, whatever. I don't, sure. So it's YouTube. Messaging isn't the easiest thing to do. They, it's not like, oh, click message. Um, so I did a little bit of research. I was like, all right, because the person's profile had no videos or anything. And, but I, I Googled the username and found that the username was tied in to several other accounts that had a lot of information about Donnie Yen and Bouse and Mark. And I was like, either this is a really elaborate hoax or this really is Donnie Yen's sister. Shot a message, got an email back. It was Donnie Yen's sister. We had a, uh, had a number of conversations and emails and she asked, she said, I want to talk to Sifu Banks because I'm, I'm doing some stuff about my mother. If anybody doesn't know who Bowson Mark is, we're, we're, I'm hesitant to do an episode because there's so much good stuff that's about to come out that it just, it feels like it would be such a poor version. Um, but I had this, this long conversation with Sifu Banks afterwards and it, we were talking about Baus and Mark, but what it turned to was a conversation about where women excel in the martial arts in a way that most, most, not allowed to get offended, most men never will be able to. And that is grace. That was the word that he and I kicked back and forth. The notion that if you watch a really, really high level woman do martial arts you can see the power you can see the speed you can see all the things that you're going to see that men have but you're going to see an element of grace potentially that very few men ever have what do men have men tend to have the ferocity that that uh, that power that is i don't mean strength power i mean like this just kind of deep primal power that most women don't tap into so there, there's the advantage there's there's the the play back and forth what one gender has that the other does not typically God, I'm, I'm, I'm it's like i can feel the emails typing out right now but to me grace is something as as a forms practitioner as someone who really enjoys doing pomse tol kata patterns whatever you call it i feel like i need to rattle off all those names each time you see me do forms. You know how passionate I am about doing forms. That grace is something that I've worked so hard to try to get into. And I feel like I've got a leg up. And this is actually something Sifu Banks and I talked about. I feel like I have a leg up on a lot of people because my primary instructor as a kid was a very powerful, graceful woman. I've watched some of her forms after her episode. And... She goes through every single step, but then she performs it at the end, and there's some serious intensity. So we talk about it in music. Yeah. As 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 very quiet music is called pia piano. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, and and that really, it, it, but it's not meant to be quiet. It's meant to be intensely quiet. Mm. And there's this and there's this intensity that you can add to that artistry of doing the form. I totally totally agree with that yeah. grace and that it's a different i feel like the power is transmuted into something I'll, else I'll a little bit more there's actually there's, there's a, also cider i also brought and there's uh, a there's a season. bottle of prosecco chilling in the fridge i did notice that when i put the yeah cider in so the i mean if we have to we can i'll take we can have some more thank you sir um grab some seltzer or water or whatever if you want to sean um so i i i think the best example that a lot of people would see, would have seen online is Riku Usami, you know, who is just this, this. I, <laughs> she is amazing. It, it's. She is amazing. She's able to channel grace in a way that, excuse me, has a physical effect on her charisma. For me, when I, when I look at her, she, you know, she's a beautiful woman. When I see her performing kata, I'm like, I would marry this girl. She stops, and I realize that would probably be a poor decision to marry someone like that. But she's just so powerfully 
beautiful as she performs because it's, it's a performance. She's we, also we, just completely exuding confidence. There's yeah. this outrageous confidence. Like if you could, you could, you could frame her kata just around her face, mm-hmm. and watch when she looks over her shoulders. Yeah. Watch whenever before she does any move, the intensity that maintains in her face. That's a great Which point. is part of the performance of a kata at that level. Yeah. Is main is what you do with your face. For sure. And and you could watch just her face and learn so much about doing forms. No doubt. <laughs> uh, Sean, what were you saying? Um, you said uh, someone like that. I was trying to get you to elaborate on what you meant by that. If I were to marry someone like that. If I was to marry someone in that way, to marry someone just because they did kata really well. <laughs> I thought of a neat question. Um, okay. It's probably a good transition point. Yeah. And it, what it you got? Be a quick question and we'll go into something else. But, right. um, I was wondering about what you thought about martial arts tattoos. Mm. Um, I know a number of people that have them. Uh, I know, so I mentioned uh, Shihan Wei Mello and a number of his students have Shotokan karate tattoos. You know, it's not something people get just, you know, when they're a yellow belt. Are they but, characters or are they like a school logo? Uh, it's, um, the, I've seen a couple different things. There's some, there's some kanji in there. And then I believe I've seen on some of the shoulder, I think one of them even has it on his chest, is the the, uh, the system uh, logo is on there. I like tattoos. I mean, I've got four of them. Um, I can I could show you three of them. None of them are, are martial arts related. The, the fourth one is right here. Um, the whistle kick logo is going on my body. I mean that's that's already been decided. Right I, here. Yeah, right. Just whistle kick across <laughs> my forehead. Well, that's one thing I was trying to get out of you is uh, yeah. your personal choice, and other people have personal choices for martial arts tattoos, and I just wanted uh, to get yeah. you to talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, I, I'm never going to argue. Anybody has the right to do what they want as long as it doesn't ha- impact somebody else. If you want a tattoo, whatever, on your face, on your head, on your back, on your foot, that, that's your choice, and you have the right to do that. Um, if somebody wants to tattoo whistle kick on their body, I'll pay for it. <laughs> that, that was a, if, if you want to put yeah. if you want to put whistle kick the whistle kick logo on your body, you can really I'll, I'll, I'll totally pay for it. Um, I have a t-shirt. There's a whole Netflix documentary people could get into. Like we could talk all night about that. There's a do- it's a documentary called Modify, mm. and it talks about the difference between mutilation and modification. Mutilation being doing something to inflict harm upon yourself to hurt someone else, or it's mm. or are you doing something to make you feel more comfortable in your own skin? And I, that and that's an important distinction. But and, that, and for that, me, that's, it's it's if, neither because you know. It, my, my, my tattoos are black, they're simple, and they tell the story of my life. You know, I'm, I'm, I have absolutely zero interest in criticizing what every someone culture. else does. It's like every culture has tattoos. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Th- there's one I want very one strong point. distinction. Yeah. There, there's one or, or exception to that, and it, it's Jewish culture. And, and that's part of the conflict for me is you know not I'm, I'm not going into a faith thing but i this is this is part of how i was raised you don't uh, adorn the body you don't improve that which god created and you have a nose ring i have a nose ring <laughs> i have earrings and you know um they tell the story of my life i didn't do them because i thought they made me look cool so um if you have martial arts tattoos, I would love to see them. You know what? If we can get a bunch of them together, that would be something really cool. You know, the show notes for this episode are probably going to be ridiculous and long. So if we can get some photos in to, to help break it up, that would be super cool. So email those in. Uh, I haven't said this for a while. We're, we're past the hour. If uh, Is that still record? Is that Instagram still going? No, it just turned off. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll pop up in a second and I'll fix that. But... Uh, Jeremy at whistlekick.com, email your photos of martial arts tattoos or any tattoos if you just want me to look at them. Um, if you have questions for the show or comments or something you want us to read, a story. I've got a couple stories actually that I'll, I'll read in a moment here. We'll, we'll come back in on that. Uh, things people wrote in. And yeah, so uh, 
Say something for like 30 seconds. You're, you're on. Sure. You're on. So I keep looking back at this map because you've got, I remember this last time I visited. I came here, recorded my episode here. Yeah. And I remember. Yeah, we sat right on the couch that's not there. Well, I'm just thinking about, um, you interviewed uh, Professor Bran Beliso probably, okay. I can't remember what episode it was, but um, he's been networking really well in Europe. He's got um, some folks that are taking on some of his uh, his programming over in Berlin, um, and I think that he was also spending some time, I think he was also in the UK. Um, he's been... Like networking all over too, yeah. but I was thinking like, how many of these states? Oh yeah, have that's, you trained that's, in? That's a great one. All right, um, Sean, if you pull that shot wide, how much how much of the map do we get? Uh, you got all of it. All of it. Awesome. Okay, so places I have done martial arts. Uh, so I grew up in Maine. So obviously Maine. Went to school in Massachusetts. Obviously Massachusetts. Um, New Hampshire, Vermont, New York, Connecticut. Um, Growing up, I did a lot of tournaments. I've, I've done tournaments in Rhode Island, so we got there. Um, let's see. California. That was forever ago. I did some training out there. Um, where else? Where else? Have I done martial arts in Florida? Didn't you do... Uh, I did martial arts in Alabama. I thought you did a super th foot thing in Florida. Or is that... Oh, yeah. Out? No, that, that, that's right. I did. That yeah. was last year. Yeah. Uh, we, were, we were in, uh, in Clearwater. That was last year's super foot conference. Um, anybody that has ordered things from, from whistlekick.com know, lately knows that those are coming out of Texas. Um, I probably kicked something in my hotel room the day that I went down. I don't know that that really counts. Um, that's training. <laughs> really, really weak training. I feel, <laughs> I, I feel like I, I did some, um, the Air Force Academy recruited me at one point. I spent a week out in Colorado Springs. And I, I feel like I did something while I was there, but we're going back too far for me to remember. Um, where else have I been? I know where I've been, but I, I, I have not done as much martial arts as, as I would like to. And I realize for me it's only three. Oh, really? I've done Vermont, I've done Maine, and California. Okay. So one of the things that I'm hoping to do, and I, I put this out on my personal Facebook feed, I'm trying, I really want to do like a tour. And, and the challenge to that is that I'm not someone who's in demand seminar wise. Like there, there are like, because I've trained in so many different styles with so many different people, it doesn't matter what setting I'm in. I've got stuff people have not learned. You know, like I'm just, I'm this bizarre amalgamation of martial arts. I'm, I am diverse, if you will. And I love teaching and I'm told, I mean, two of the three of you in the room have, have, taken a class with me and, and I've heard I'm a, I'm a decent teacher. So I would love to have a whole bunch of seminars lined up and rent like an RV and just drive across the country and teach for like a couple months. Like, I think that would be super cool. That'd be right. Um, I mean, that would just you could make it a documentary, a whistle kick documentary. Right. I mean, that, that would just be so much fun. Um, but I'm just the, the back end support resources. Like I, I'm still needed to run whistle kick and there's so the much I can do on the company. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, there, and there's stuff happening. I mean, there are people coming in behind the scenes that are starting to pick up some of those roles, and I'm, I really dig that. Uh, it's making a lot of things better and, and easier. So it's a good question. So let, let's do this. I'm going uh, to kick you off camera. I'm going to read sure. these stories. Yeah. And, and then when I'm done with there, Kimberly can come on camera, and we can, she can ask me a question. So um, thanks, everybody. I'm sure we'll see Dan again. Um, so if you followed the social media the last couple months, you saw that we've been pumping episode 200 like crazy because you know what? If I'm going to do a three-hour marathon episode, I want to make sure there are people watching. I want to make sure that, that people are engaged and, and submitting and whatever. So I asked for stories. I asked for comments. I asked for whatever people wanted to share. And what I have here are two letters that I really wanted to share Um from listeners, and, and one of them is a new listener, the other is in somebody who's been a listener for a long time, and I kind of like that juxtaposition. So the first one, I, I cropped out a little bit at the beginning here. 
I've been listening to your podcast for a few months now. First of all, I would like to say thank you so much for taking the time to put out your content. I'm really enjoying listening and learning something new every week. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I've been meaning to write to you for some time, but always put it off because I felt I couldn't have an opinion on martial arts because I'm very early in my journey. I began Sen Xiao Quan, Chinese kickboxing, my apologies if I pronounced that poorly, in January of this year at the ripe old age of 35. Well, I'm 38, so... In episode 199, you very kindly requested your listeners to get in touch, and I couldn't refuse your request, so here I am. To explain how I came to martial arts, I have to tell you my story, and I know you like to hear a good story, so we'll begin. Yes, I do. My husband and I have struggled with infertility for many years. Five years ago, we had IVF treatment, and God blessed us with a beautiful boy. Last year, we decided to give IVF another go to add to our family. Unfortunately, that cycle was unsuccessful, and it completely broke my heart. I have always been a soft and gentle person, and I found myself turning into an angry and bitter creature, and I knew I had to do something to stop this downward spiral. I found a local ladies-only kickboxing class, and to date, I've only ever missed two sessions. Martial arts helped me channel my aggression and anger and enabled me to begin the healing process. It gave me something to focus on. In May, I took my first grading and am now a very proud yellow belt. Martial arts enabled me to take my grief and turn it into something positive. I will never get to hold my baby, but I dedicated my yellow belt to my baby and think of him every time I wear it. In addition to overcoming grief, martial arts has shown me what I am capable of. I struggled to learn the first form, Lohan Chao, and it was a great personal achievement when I got it right for the first time. Through martial arts, I am now constantly redefining my personal limitations. I now truly believe that I can achieve anything if I try hard enough. I have particularly enjoyed listening to the interviews with Sensei Ian Abernethy, fellow Brit, Sensei Ando, and Mr. Donovan Barrett. I have also listened to many others, and a resounding common theme I took away from them all was humility. For people with so much experience and talent, I didn't detect an ounce of arrogance, and this, to me, demonstrates the true value of having martial arts in one's life. I would love for you to feature a San Shao practitioner in a future episode. I will also love it if you could interview Aaron and Michael from Karate Culture Channel on YouTube. Although I don't practice karate, I love their passion and dedication, and feel others may take inspiration from them too. I would also like to know your thoughts on why so many people begin martial arts in childhood, but relatively few continue it into adulthood. I would also like to share this video with you, as for me it truly illustrates that martial arts transcends all colors, races, and creeds, and shows the resilience of human beings in adversity. The video, uh, this is me talking, not reading. The video is, um, is about a, a women's wushu program in Afghanistan, and we've featured that a couple times over social media. It's pretty powerful stuff. And if you haven't checked it out, you could probably Google Afghan women wushu and, and, and you'll get it. There have been a ton of stories, been a lot of press on this program because it's something that is so, um, it's something so rare over there right now. And it's, it's good stuff and it's giving some, some really good things to women. So back to reading. Thank you for taking the time to read my email. May I kindly request that I remain anonymous if my story is mentioned in a podcast. I look forward to the listening to the recording of episode 200 very soon. Hey, right now. Uh, so real quick, humility. Yeah, absolutely. Within the episodes, the vast majority of the guests that we have are humble because they've done stuff. If you've done things, if you've accomplished things, you don't need to hide behind your ego. And that's something that I see a lot outside of martial arts uh, and outside of the martial artists that will be invited on this show. We have had a few guests on that I, I would say have a pretty strong ego, but for the majority, no. And most of the ones that are ever gonna come on this show are gonna pass that humility test because I don't, you know, after 200 episodes, we have a lot of people that wanna come on the show. I mean, that, that shouldn't be any surprise. We uh, started working on episodes going into that will be airing in mid-August at this point and the only reason that we're not further out is because I'm trying to slow down I mean there are weeks where I've done four or five interviews people want to come on the show I love that it's fantastic I don't need to kiss anybody's butt or bring people on that don't fit within what I'm trying to portray which is the positive stuff within martial arts all right the second one so there, there were that there's a bit of a downer element in there, but it's it's pretty powerful. It shows how strong martial arts can be, and, and you know that's 
what is that question four tell us about a time in your in your martial arts experience that you were able to lean on your training to get through something difficult so this one jeremy congratulations on your upcoming 200th podcast episode clearly a tremendous achievement and a testament to your dedication I would love to participate in this live event, but unfortunately, I am already committed to taking my wife and daughters to the Red Sox game Monday night. I'm a Yankees fan. Hope they lose. <laughs> I listened to your Q&A number three podcast this morning on my commute into the office. You suggested to drop you a note with any topics of interest for the live event. Like you, but in a different way, I have chosen to give back to the martial arts by promoting the benefits of the lifestyle. I have a little blog that attempts to do this from the perspective of a corporate executive, me, that has achieved above average personal and professional success. I am convinced that I would not have achieved this success if not for my martial arts lifestyle and mindset. I have heard countless guests on your podcast make similar statements, and if I were able to participate in the live podcast, this is the topic I would have proposed for discussion in more depth. Oh well, maybe next time. Episode 400, perhaps? Regardless, I wish you the best of luck on Monday night, and I will certainly tune in for the rebroadcast when available. You are doing some really impactful things for the martial arts, Jeremy. We all owe you a debt of gratitude. My best. Chris Baird. P.S. Hope to see you at a seminar again real soon. So, um, Mr. Barron is holds a special place in my heart because he was the first person that was ever a listener before I met him. I was at a Superfoot seminar in New Hampshire and was introducing myself to the people there that I didn't know. And... I shake hands with this man and I, I give him my name and he says, I know who you are. I listen to your show. And that was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. And we got to work together that day. And since then we've emailed a bunch and the, the blog, the website that Mr. Barron runs is called Marshall way to success. And if you guys could, Sean, if you could confirm that it's Marshall way to success.com. If you could just fire that up and just double check for me. Uh, because I don't want to give the, the viewers any false information. And um, hopefully I'll, I'll see you at one of those Superfoot seminars in November, Mr. Barron. So um, if I remember, he lives in Massachusetts or Southern New Hampshire. So right, right, in, your, right in your geographic area, get, the, get those dates down on your calendar. So a lot of fun. I really, I really dig those letters. Yeah, marshallwaytosuccess.com. And we'll get that into the show notes as well. Okay. Um, you, want, you want to come on and, yeah. and ask your question? Okay. So we've, we've upgraded from a CrossFit shirt to a CrossFit shirt with a whistle kick sticker <laughs> on the strap. So, oh, here. yeah, have a seat. <clears throat> okay. Those stickers, um, I bought them and I had no idea why I bought them. I spent like $500 on three rolls of those stickers because there was a point in time with the last company, with the IT company where um, I, div not, not in any illegal way, but e like every, every nickel that came in that wasn't needed to operate the IT company was diverted into Whistlekick. And I was like, ah, what can I buy? And I was like, I'm gonna we had a client that made stickers. And I was like, I want rolls of these stickers. And so their minimum was like 2,500 of those stickers. And so I just used them in weird ways. Whistlekick like, stickers are just instant upgrades. Yes. Oh, this is my friend, Kimberly like McNeil, slash uh, cat supervisor, mm, yeah. um, Aikido and Qigong practitioner. And, and we met through CrossFit when Celia was like, hey, you guys do martial arts. You should be friends. And now we're friends. And she's got a shaker bottle with a... With water in it. What looks to be like a... It's vodka. Like a... Uh, uh, an expand... Like a... Uh, one of those, like... Remember the toys when we were kids? You, younger people won't know what I'm talking about, but like the sponges <laughs> and you pour water on them and they grew and then you can play with them. It looks like it would be that, but Grover. Or, or Cookie Monster. Like I just <laughs> just threw the, the vague refraction of... Perfect. Of, yeah, like it's going to turn into Grover. What are you drinking over there? I don't know, Dan. What am I drinking? <laughs> you were drinking brute champagne. I'm drinking brute champagne. Wow! Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. Two hundred. Two hundred episodes. Whoa! Happy yeah. birth episode. <laughs> no, birthdays were a couple weeks ago. Yeah. No, that's true. We shared. Her, this... her birthday is like a minute after mine. Yeah, it's true. Pretty much. Hmm. Nine? Ten? Nine. Yeah. Yeah, and and mine's like the very end of eight. So. <laughs> it's 
like like literally minutes. We have yet to celebrate together. We still haven't celebrated. We're... This doesn't count. I mean, sort uh-huh. of counts. I can go get that vodka. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> All right. All right. Should I ask you my questions? Yeah, ask questions. Man, how many are we doing? So uh, many. If you need more paper, just pull some out of the printer in the office. Okay. So I wanted to know first, um, how has your path on Whistlekick Radio changed or formed your internal development, like regarding your monkey mind or like the sense of purpose? And, You're such like, a Qigong practice. I know. Your well, or <laughs> Shoshin, like beginner's mind. So if you want yeah. to go into... Um, how's it affected how's it formed it yeah um how how has it affected it so i think the biggest thing is i i spent a lot more time thinking about martial arts than i did you know not just in preparation for episodes or or in doing things for whistle kick but because i've talked to these brilliant people who have these brilliant perspectives on life and the martial arts and spending enough time talking with those people like actually has changed the way I think and view the world. And I don't know if it's the same effect for listeners. Yeah, there's, Sean is holding up a big bottle of Tangare <laughs> yeah. and, and offering to it to, to Camille. And, uh, and I, I, I know that's not going to happen. She doesn't drink. So um, she's a good sport about it though. I, I don't know if it would be the same as a listener, but I, I'm pretty sure, for me at least, it, it would be the same. To spend that time listening to these people talk about something that they're so incredibly passionate about and so are, most of them, the vast majority of them, so articulate about. And then I start connecting dots because the majority of the guests don't listen to all the other episodes. I mean, we have some guests that have come on as fans or, or some, some guests were, were fans of the show first and some guests become fans of the show after the experience, but most of them aren't doing that. So like, that's kind of my role, is to be the, the thread weaving between all of them and finding those similarities. And, and you know, there are times in episodes where I'll reference another episode, and I try to put that in the show notes to say, you know, we talked about this on this episode, and it's not that I'm trying to name drop, it's just I'm trying to... to help the listeners that may not have connected those dots connect the dots because i think that there's a a process there yeah what's the process what do you find to be the common thread that like really quiets that like brings the noise out of the picture and really draws the similarities between these people that we're all the same you know we're, we're you know i i've heard i've heard people say and you've probably heard the saying that you know we're we're all having a human experience you know, the notion that, that, you know, metaphysically, whatever you believe, the idea that, you know, we're here for a time and then we're not. You know, whether we, we move on somewhere else or we're gone, like we're here, we're here at this moment and some stuff's happening. We're having a martial experience, a martial arts experience. And for each of us, that's different, but we're all <laughs> headed in the same direction. We start at different points on the path. Are the, the destination we get to is different. The destination we would like to get to is different. But we're all moving in that same direction. So the destination is different, but the but the but we're headed in the same direction. So we're all headed north. Okay, okay. So, in your sense of purpose, like quieting your mind about your practice, how is whistle kick and the form and like from the inception of whistle kick, like really formed that in your practice. similar I spend a lot more time thinking okay you know it's I've come up with some really interesting concepts you know one of the things that that you and I share is is a a passion for for movement in and outside of martial arts and and one of the things that I've spent some time working on myself and, and teaching are is this interesting Venn diagram intersection of CrossFit and, and martial arts and gymnastics and and really it's about body mechanics you know I've, I've said it I mean, I've already said it today I say it almost every episode that there are only so many ways that the body can move and only so many of them make sense in the in the under the, the auspices of combat but there are some things that we can take from these other disciplines that I believe are actually 
in martial arts and and most people I'm not gonna say all but most people don't know because it's at further down the path than a lot of people get to around body mechanics there's some things that, that I've, I've worked with around um, just pelvis yeah. and pelvic tilt that um, you know the first I, I was nervous to present it the first time in a, in a in a mixed group and I had people ranging from you know like blue belt up to like six degree black belt and I was like Here's this thing I'm working on, and every one of them just kind of went. Yeah, light bulb. That's you know, the same there thing. there was there were a lot of light bulbs, and it was really cool to see that. Yeah. So, you know, I spent a lot of time driving. I spent a lot of time sitting and thinking, but my mind is always working. I've always been like that. So there are a lot of a lot of notes, a lot of I want to try this, and most of it doesn't work out. Hmm. You know, most of the ideas I have don't work out. You should see the T-shirt designs and things that just. They were horrid. But I think more about martial arts. You know, I've gotten to a point where, you know, my my, my physical body is still, still fine. I'm, you know, I just turned 30. I'm in the best shape of my life. But that's not going to continue forever. But I've got a foundation now where my brain can kind of move forward at a faster pace than my body can. Cool. Well, yeah, that leads really nicely into my next question, which was, you know, comparing martial arts like which of the martial arts, and it seems that you, you know, you, as you said before, you have this amalgamation of um, experiences and like um, periods in which you've trained in different forms and styles and that kind of thing. Which of these do you feel like has specifically built your body or has been more potent in building a structure um, specific to that art? Because uh, some, I think, may be less potent than others. I don't think it's the art. I think it's the way it's practiced. Jeremy, I want to I chime in for a second. I want you to think about that so oh. you can think of a really good answer. And I want to let you know that we're, ha- we're at the halfway point. We're halfway through the show. And we have, we have over 600 views. Just uh, just so you can <laughs> think about that while you That's speak. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. 600 people have watched this? Yes. I don't know. It's probably like three of them watching it at any one time. They're just like, ah, oh, that guy sucks. No. Like, <laughs> uh, the optimistic. They're, they're, saying, they're saying that guy sucks a lot. It's volume. <laughs> good, good. Um, I, I've trained karate in multiple schools. I've trained taekwondo in multiple schools. And, and what I've found is that the parameters that are set out in any style allow for a lot of individualization mm-hmm. in the way that it is interpreted and the way that it is trained. So if you view martial arts as something to develop your your mind and your spirit and your body i mean you can go at that so many different ways if i do push-ups until i puke every time i train my body's going to develop and my resiliency mentally spiritually is going to develop too because to go in and say i'm going to do push-ups until i puke one that's insane and you shouldn't do it but it's kind of an extreme example. Well, you were in the military. You don't. <laughs> I know. Yeah, why not? You don't. You're used to doing push-ups until you puke, right? Yeah, I'm getting two thumbs up. Um, <laughs> you think your mind follows your body, though? And your body follows your mind, right? You know that they're. I mean, we can we talk about them separately, but they're just. It's not. Okay. It's not like there's there's one connection you can sever. It's it's woven. So it's this the, is me weaving my fingers. So it's the type of <laughs> the way in which you weave your your mind and body is what you're saying yeah the way in which you approach it yeah i mean i can you know i can practice my forms with really low stances and develop my legs yeah. or i can not mm-hmm. and say i'm never gonna fight with those low stances you know like you, you can look at it in all kinds of different ways um so you don't feel like your body specifically built like it leans more towards one art than another no, my no. mind does, but my body yeah. doesn't. Okay. I had the same feeling as you, Jeremy. Yeah. Where my my mind does, but my body does not. Mm-hmm. Cool. Do yeah. Think, well, I'll get into that in a second. Okay. I was like, um, so, like, that also leads to you know your cross training or your cross fit training yeah. and your gymnastics training, and that's building your body for specific or for multi- multiple functions. So, you know, if you could speak to like the many hats that you wear, which is martial arts instructor, CrossFit instructor, and gymnastics instructor, and how that builds your mind and your body for, you know, martial arts practice. And then how does that translate to your, um, the way in which you perceive and, and sort of attack 
sure. the um, the whistle kick mission. Okay. So there's kind of two parts there. So the, yeah. the first one, it's hard for me to go back to a point in time before I remember viewing teaching in this way. But the thing that I think I'm, I'm good at as an instructor is my ability to see the way people use their body and make adjustments that fit what they're trying to do. And that was improved greatly when I started doing CrossFit, when I started coaching CrossFit, when I started coaching gymnastics, because I was able to see the body move in very similar ways, but for very different reasons. Yeah. You know, the idea of doing a squat in CrossFit is not that different from doing a deep front stance in martial arts. A lot, the, bo the body is the same. A lot of the biomechanics are the same. Mm -hmm. So the more... You know, it's it's like any it's like doing different martial arts. You're 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 gonna have overlap. So the more different examples I had of the way the body could and should move, mm -hmm. the better I was able to say, okay, well that's a squat. So if that's ideal there, why is that not ideal here? And then I started playing with it, and that that kind of led to you know I gave the example of, of pelvic tilt within stances. And once I was able to better see all these examples of other people. I was able to bring that back to my own training and say, okay, so if nine out of 10 people are dropping the ball in doing this, there's a good chance I am. I should check that out. Yeah. So I've gotten better at self-examination with my own training mm -hmm. because uh, let's be honest, I don't train as much as I would like to. I mean, a good week for me is training twice. Yeah, yeah. you're busy. <laughs> I've yeah. kind of got this whistle kick thing going on. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Yeah. So, um, I, you know, that brings me to like, what has your definition? So you're talking about body mechanics and how it, it you know, you can cross disciplines um, and you say, you know, your body isn't really de developed for any specific discipline. So that must mean that also you you have a, you're, it must be that you started in one martial art. You had a definition of martial arts in your head when you began as a martial artist, and it must have changed over time. And I wonder how that that definition has changed because there's martial art applications and there's that internal aspect of it. Yeah. There's that cross. And, and we've that, and we've know, talked about this yeah, a little sure. bit. But I think it's a really interesting topic. That, you know. So to me, mar like early on and even early in the show, martial arts to me was kind of the um, the Supreme Court's definition of obscene. I know it when I see it. But that didn't work in the context of the show. Right. Because I was claiming I was trying to bring some unification, not in, in, in practice, but in culture and spirit, to martial arts overall. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I had to kind of define what a martial art was, because otherwise I was trying to unify everything and nothing, and that's some really weird kind of Bruce Lee Buddhist... Dalai Lama stuff going on there that just doesn't work. So I took a look at the things that I knew as martial arts and the things that I, I would kind of draw the line for. And, and interestingly, and this has come up on the show a few times, to me, most, no hate mail, MMA doesn't qualify with my definition of, of martial arts. And, 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 and I've said that I, I really wish that <laughs> we had not, that the, the acronym MMA had not been used, it had been MMC, Mixed Martial Combat. Yeah. Because not that there are not MMA practitioners that aren't martial artists, mm -hmm. but all MMA is not martial arts. Well, there's like, there's a feudal martial arts, there's a feudal martial arts period where like combat and being the most efficient that you can be in a martial situation is that martial art. Sure. Had, and then there were periods of peace where the art really came to the front foreground right. of that discipline. So, right. I mean, do you feel like that's the f that's where the flexibility exists or do you feel like this is a completely different animal mixed martial arts? It's about intent. Yeah. It's okay. it's about why you train. Yeah. I'd like to chime in on this. I think uh, a lot of mixed martial arts Are people... you bringing up your camera? Oh, no, and, I will and your you. audio? I will for you cuz I Come on, you. man. I thought you were a professional. If, if, right, if so... you're if you're going to talk I want you on camera, and I want people to. I want that mic on so people can hear. Yeah, you. I'm gonna chime in on this, and I, I think what you're saying is uh, partially right, but I think most mixed mixed martial arts people come from somewhere. They had to learn something and start from somewhere. 
Not all of them, but I think the good ones. Maybe they did, you know, started with Taekwondo, or that some of them are really good at Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, or uh, Karate, or Judo. And you can see that in the style they use. Not all of them, but a good number of them started off as kids coming up through some sure. art form. Sure, sure. And, and I, I will, you know, I'll agree that it's not all, but more than some. I, w- I won't draw the line. You know, I won't say it's it's most or not most, you know, or many. I, I, won't, I won't make that line because how do I know? Um, but you're right. The, I'd say that, you know, and there are quite a few out there that I respect. You know, George St. Pierre, I have a tremendous amount of respect for him and, and Sage Northcutt, who absolutely, you know, excelled in um, sport martial arts and then made the transition into the UFC because there's no money in sport martial arts. I'm going to change. Um, but it, if, if we look at it, and, and, and this is hard because when we talk about MMA we often talk about the UFC because it, it is the, the I don't know about largest but it's premier. the most prominent it is the premier. Yeah, body it's the first sort of um, for, for mixed martial arts and there's a, a strong element of showmanship and showmanship is easier when there is controversy and in conflict. So how much of what's going on at these weigh-ins and how much is uh, is going on in, in stuff leading up to the fights is orchestrated and how much of it is, is genuine, I don't know. But I know that the moment someone is talking smack, that kind of, like high levels of smack about an opponent I'm losing respect for them. They're not doing it for the reasons that I... Yeah, they're doing it for money. They're not doing it for the reasons that I feel a true, developed martial artist would. Uh Which is why I I enjoy watching Amateur. So, um, what is it? It's Monday. Um, A week and a half ago, I I was in Maine. I set up at a a tournament and... um, He's not been on the show. I hope to get him on the show at some point. Sensei Raz, uh, a friend of mine who is an absolute monster, he's on the card at 6'6", was fighting his second pro fight. And it wasn't his fight, but there was another fight where that just... It completely embodied what I love about amateur MMA and how it can be... Even if these folks are not martial artists by the definition that we will ultimately get to me giving, it embodies the martial spirit, which is... So there was this guy who was defending his lightweight title, and the the um, the challenger was a based on the way he moved in his haircut, a former marine, and was fifty two years old. I remember this story. Okay, yeah, yeah. And they square off, and they tap gloves, and there's a lot of wild swinging, and and you know not it's I don't remember if this was an amateur or a pro fight, but you know this was not the UFC. These were not people being paid a ton of money. But they're going at each other. And at the end of the fight, it went to decision. And the old guy won. And everybody knew the old guy won because he wasn't, you know, he stayed consistent. In fact, he got a little better as the, the younger guy got tired and took some shots. But the guy put his belt that he just lost around the other guy's waist and buckled it for him. And that right there, like, I got, I got a little bit emotional. Because that, to me, just exemplified what it should be. And it's why I like amateur stuff more. Because you don't, you don't see that in the UFC. I don't see, you know, if somebody loses their, their belt, you know, the best I've seen. I don't watch every fight. There's, like, one every weekend. But the best I see is he deserved to win. This guy wasn't just he deserved to win. He's like, here's my belt. Yeah. Respect. You know? So the definition that I give on the show is personal development through the guise of combat. And the, the piece I added in after our conversation yeah, on this, okay. because Kimberly had offered the example of what about someone who's training to be a sniper? And I was like, oh, crap, that kind of, that could work, sound. right? So I, I added in the words unarmed, personal development through the guise of unarmed combat or hand-to-hand combat which you know it gets a little dicey in there you know zen archery right you know so there's still an element of i know it when i see it but at the very root of it it's what is the intention why is someone there if you're going to a taekwondo class and your goal is to learn how to beat the snot out of people you are not a martial artist okay 
That's, I think that's really clear. I think that's super clear. So that leads really nicely into my next question, which is traditionally martial artists, artists, true artists, traditionally, <laughs> tr true martial artists, martial artists in, in the traditional sense, go from, um, they enter into this wanting to beat the snot out of someone or feel better about themselves or protect themselves or, or who, their loved ones. And they have become, a why. They have a why, and it's usually a warrior why. Right, and then there's this other path that kind of comes from the warrior wise. You get to know uh, other bodies and relate to others and develop internally, um, and that is like psychologically or emotionally you start to connect. Um, and I think martial arts is a lot about connection, um, and they become much more of um, a healer. And then traditionally, it kind of it evolves into this healer, warrior, healer, spiritual path. You know, and that's like kind of known as the threefold path. I was wondering, you know, how, do you see yourself going into this traditional sort of trajectory, um, you know, as a martial artist with the intent of internal development and continuing to develop yourself um, under the guise of, you know, martial application? Well, before you answer, Jeremy, may I chime in? Please. Um, I'm going to say, like, this is a very, very good question. Um, mm -hmm. My goal at the beginning of my path yeah. was to get my black belt. But very quickly that changed, and, and now I'm doing taekwondo and jujitsu, and I don't, I don't even care about my belt. I want it to be part of my life, something that I have there every day. Instead of going to the gym six days a week, mm -hmm. I want to be doing these arts and developing my mind and my body yeah. because I'm realizing how good it is for me as a person with my morals, with my physical body, with my whole life all together. Right, you expand as it, a person. It, it, it very quickly changed my what my outlook and my goals were. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well, you, I think you can kind of see, like, when you drop the pebble in the, in the puddle, the ripples kind of come out in a positive way, right? And that's the healing aspect of this, of this art. You go from, a, you know, wanting to build your body, be tougher, like, you know, have a sense of presence and, and purpose to getting a sense of presence and purpose, I, I believe. It doesn't always have to be like, I'm going into acupuncture or I'm, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm right. going to become a doctor or whatever it is, a massage therapist. It could be just that, you know, and it ripples out and ripples out and ripples out. And then you kind of understand the more subtle nature of, of the healing path. And it turns into this somewhat more, yeah, everything starts rippling, right? So I'm just kind of curious to know, like, do you see, do you have a vision of your trajectory? Do you see yourself um, moving into that? No, I don't. And that's okay. interesting because, uh, you know, I, I have so many aspects of my life planned out and I look out into the future in so many ways. But one of the ways that I don't is my martial arts training. Uh -huh. You know, it's, I'm a martial artist. I'm going to train when I can. I'm going to hopefully get better mm -hmm. I'm gonna try to learn new things and train with new people and train for really the sake of training okay. um, you know if I was to look back on my martial arts life you know at no point would I ever have imagined that I would be here now I mean it just it's utter the the life I have now like whistle kick and the people that I've spoken with and the fact that I am friends with Bill Wallace, like these, all of these things are so utterly ludicrous to me that I cannot wrap my mind around them. Like it just, it just, I don't, I don't, I can't. Like when I, when I hung up the phone with, don't, don't hurt yourself. The cat's rubbing on the side. She's going to die. <laughs> they weigh like half what she does. Um, if not more. What? When I hung up with, with, no, don't pick her up. She's, she doesn't like to be picked up. No, she's fine with being picked up, but she is so out of sorts right now that, that, I mean, when she ran through earlier and she was hissing at you. I like, know we get just... more views, though, if you get cats in the video. <laughs> Come here. I once sold something on eBay, and the rabbit jumped into the picture last minute, and I just used it and put it in the description. Um, <laughs> rabbit not included. You know, if you keep ranking up at our school, though, to speak to her point, you're going to have to learn some of the healing art. Okay. It's actually in the high ranks. We start teaching Sifu Kujutsu, which is healing. Cool. I'm going to learn <laughs> some Sifu Kujutsu. Sifu Kujutsu. Sifu Kujutsu. Ah, so this brings me to No, hold on. Question. Hold on, I'm not done. No, you, I'm not done. Yeah, you, um, it's good. So whether you like it, you can do it, you're going to get it. it it's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's weird. And I'm just, I'm so aware of how weird it is. Oh, that's what I was saying. When I was done speaking with Fumio Demer, I just, I cried. 
because this is someone who has been so instrumental in the martial arts community globally and and personally that I just I, I just I talked to Fumio Demer. I never thought I would. People told me I would never get to talk to him, and I did. And I just ah. So now it's it's this very neutral attitude. It's I'm gonna go where I'm called. I'm gonna train where I can with who I can and learn what I can. Yeah. Okay. So I I was just gonna ask you. So because that introduction kind of speaks to. I'll get to one of these other questions. But do you find yourself being externally motivated just because you have you sort of inundated with op- opportunities? Yes and no. Yeah. Um, the the biggest challenge I have is that because I am an amalgamation of martial arts, um, there is a perception among some that I should be higher rank. So I, I don't talk about my rank very often because I really don't care. Um, I, I, so I, I'm going to chime in. I happen to know others that would give Jeremy higher rank, but he is so loyal to his master and the people he trains with, yeah. and he doesn't care about it. And that's a true martial artist in my uh, eyes. Well, that feels weird, so we're not even gonna talk about it. But, um, you know, my highest rank is, is a third degree black belt in, in Taekwondo. Um, I'll step out of my comfort zone. I have been training for 34 years. Um, there probably aren't a lot of people who are third degree black belts that have been training for 34 years. Um, I don't care about that. All I ever, and and here, this is a perfect illustration. So, and this is part of why I put this on the table. I figured it would come up. So this is my black belt. This is my only black belt. This is the only black belt I've ever had. It's the only black belt I've ever worn. It's the only black belt I really care to have. I mean, there's some fraying to it. Um... (laughs) This, there's no, there are no stripes. There's my name's not on it, and that's not. I'm not disre- meaning to say that disrespectfully of anyone else. That was my goal. A, not that I wanted to stop training at black belt, but to me, excuse me, that was my standard. I wanted to become a black belt and train as a black belt and live as a black belt. I don't need the stripes. Because it doesn't reflect anything more. I mean, that's a symbol, and, and, and that's a paradox. And I think it was, um, I think you had given me the question about the martial arts paradox. Yes. You know, the idea, that, and, and, and we may get to this later, the idea that we, we spend all this time training to win a fight and then really working hard and never use it, you know, and it, it, in a sense you could see it as wasted. Um, this is my most valuable possession. If, if, if the house was burning down, and once I got everybody that was alive, everything that was living out, and maybe some of the... No, that would be the thing. Like, I, I, would, I would sooner leave my wallet and my passport and my TV and... Yeah, like, everything else other than what is alive. Like, my black belt is the one thing that I would save. But in a sense, it's meaningless. Like, it's, it's so hard to articulate and and you may get it in some of the listeners out there may i keep saying listeners even though you guys are watching some of the viewers i'm in tv land now some of the viewers may get this you know if you've been training a while and if you have that attitude but it's not wrong if you don't um but there are opportunities i am not afforded because i only only have a third degree black belt so how strongly is your identity tied to your black belt status? Somebody here uh, just chimed in and said that they think uh, sometimes putting gold bars on your belt tends to lead to egos. Yeah. It can. It absolutely can. And um, they've had people treat them differently because of their rank. Sure. That happened at your seminar. Yeah. So your seminar, um, my instructor was there. We don't put stripes on our belts. Right. And somebody said, who has the most experience here? <coughs> and... And your brother spoke up, and he's a fourth degree, yeah. and he spoke up, and he stepped up, and it just happened to be that he came from a school where the tradition was having stripes on the belt. Yeah. And, the, and the instructor just had a culture that said, said, he said something offhand, he said something like, when you have more stripes on your belt, maybe you'll understand this better, or something like that. Right. And, really and, and it was, 
Sorry. Nope. Well, and, 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 the and Daniel and I have talked yeah, about this because yeah, I, I know the scenario we're yeah. talking about, and it so, wasn't it wasn't an arrogant thing. It, it was a, a. It's just a cultural thing. He was operating from a different perspective. He didn't. Sometimes we 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 don't know what we don't know, and so when you make an assumption about the way you know, like the best example I can offer, I was brought up that that belt does not touch the ground unless you're wearing it. And then I start doing Taekwondo and people are like, belt, and they're just throwing it. And I was just like, oh my God. I see and, the same thing in jujitsu. You know, and it, it was just like, I don't, I, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, there's an etiquette right? within, yeah, Aikido, which definitely, like, these weapons wouldn't really be out here like this. But that's the difference between you sure. and I. Also, like, you wouldn't be having a cord over the top of it. Like, there's definitely, like, a reference that doesn't exist in other disciplines. Right. Culture, they represent think, so different things, you know, and they, there is there is no wrong. There's just different and there can be inconsistent with your goals or values. Mm-hmm. Um, I would make no judgments of you seeing your black belt with no stripes. That's what I'm saying. I would right. see your black belt and I would say, what can you show me? I, I, I just yeah. wanted I just want to tie this off though. Yeah. So there are people that have not offered me to teach, and, and, and there are opportunities that would benefit whistle kick. It's not about me. It's not my ego. It's the fact that I will do anything to advance the goals of whistle kick because I believe in the good that is happening as a result of whistle kick's growth. This is your identity. No. No. This is purpose. This is purpose. Yeah. This is amazing purpose. Yeah, I, I, th- I think that's so, a better word for it. Black belt, not identity. No. Yeah. I am a black belt. But I am not black belt. Yeah. Okay. I get it. I hope you guys get it too. <laughs> um, okay. So the next question I have is um, from a viewer. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, his name is Russ Witt. Thanks, Russ. It's common. Hi, Russ. Pra- Shout out. Hi, Russ. Thanks. Um, it's, he said it's common practice to ask permission of your... In- is it co- He's asking if it's common practice to ask permission of your instructor to study another martial art or system mm. and have you had a problem with your instructors being as that you you know had so many mm. so i don't know if i would say it is common practice it should be okay mm. um so so i'm going to i'm going to i'm going to go into this and we tend with you we we hope no go because we because we style about. really hate it so you should if, if you're training somewhere and you want to train with somebody else you should absolutely ask your instructor. And if your instructor says no, you should consider strongly what that means and how that lines up with your values and your goals. I will not take someone as my instructor if they are going to box me in. That is something that is critically important to me. I've had people try to do it to me before, and I just said, see ya. Like, I'm just... I'm. I'm that's not what I'm about. It's never been what I'm about. I'm I'm active in three schools right now. Like, I love to train. If I had more time, it would be more. Be- One of the goals with Whistle Kick is that I, like, record the podcast, don't do any editing or any of that. Like, I, I do a few hours a week of, of recording, and I spend the rest of the time training. Like, that's that's what, that's the goal. That'd be fun. It made me so happy when you showed up at our school first time. Where's your school? Simonuski. So, um... And he, and he had the humility to say, I want to come in, I want to put on a white belt, and I want to do everything a white belt's going to do. And he's been going right through the program. It's awesome. Because I love to train, and I learned the hard way through Taekwondo that... You know, I, was, I, was, I wasn't quite grandfathered because I did have to test... Instagram died? Okay. I did have to test, but what I what I did was I lined up with my black belt as a first degree black belt there, and it was after a certain period of time, my instructor was like, hey, okay, it's time for you to test for your black belt. So I missed a lot of the nuance, and I said, I don't want to do that again. You know, I, I want the nuance. Because I want to be able to, to teach it. And, and now, you know, 11 years in, I've picked up most of the nuance that I think I would have had otherwise. And a lot of that's come from embarrassing situations of, 
and I've, I've learned, I've, I've smartened up now, you know, I'll go to somebody else, usually my brother, because he's, Brendan loves nuance. Uh, why is that happening? It's like, oh, because of X, Y, Z. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, like, like, like I assume if something's really weird and I don't get it, that I probably, that that person, I don't assume that person's wrong anymore. Yeah. I'm, I, I go to someone who's, you know, a step higher than yeah, me to say, eh, what's happening here? Um, that's this, beginner's it's, mind. It's a, it's a tough, thank you. It, it's a, it's a tough subject that, that he's bringing up. The idea that other, you know, the, the desire to train in, to cross train, to train in other disciplines and, and an instructor that may or may not allow that. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons and, and it's come up on the show and I want it. I don't know if it was a segment on a, on a Thursday show or an entirety of a Thursday show. Because now with 200 episodes, I don't remember them all. I'm sorry. Um, maybe for episode 300, we'll have a guy or a girl. We'll have a person, not a cat, at a laptop <laughs> that can be like, oh, I think he knows what a... You know, and they'll just type it out and be like, no, you, you got other stuff you're working on. Yeah. Okay, so um, we can keep on going with the conversation. I just want to bring this up. We're at the two-hour mark, so... <laughs> We're two thirds of the way done. We've covered a wow. lot of things. Yeah. A lot of things we never knew we were going to cover. Yeah. No, and, this um, is fun. There, I'm going to mention four things that I want to make sure that we cover in the next hour. Um, and we I can one of them. We could do whatever else uh, we want. Okay. But, um, uh, Fumio Demura as your favorite episode. Yes. I, want to talk I, about I know that you wanted to talk about that. Um, I want to talk about um, your two super foot tests because yes. I know everybody's really interested in Bill Superfoot Wallace and yeah. how that goes and exactly what that art is and what it means. Sure. And uh, I, I want to talk about your goals. Okay. And I want to talk about when you had a school. Okay. So let's, we'll, we'll finish up with this stuff that you've got going sure. there and then we'll, we'll start into there and, uh, yeah, sounds great. okay. Um, so I don't remember if it was a, a, a subtopic for a Thursday show or if it was <coughs> in entirety, but there are, are positive and negative reasons why an instructor might not want a student to go cross train. Like imagine somebody steps into a school and they've been training there for a month and they're doing taekwondo and they want to go across town on opposing days and do a different style of taekwondo yeah. like that can really mess with your head like to, to learn you know it would be easier if it was taekwondo and brazilian jiu-jitsu because you're you're you know you're not going to be you're, you're not going to be lined up throwing sidekicks and accidentally put somebody in a triangle. Like, the, it, like it doesn't happen that way. You're correct on your footwork. It you're, depends on... Everything that you're told is right is going to be different. Right. But if you're doing things that are similar, but there is a right and wrong way to do them in that context, that's going to make learning hard. So, so, I could, so as, if I was an instructor, I wouldn't say no, but I would say, here's why you shouldn't. Not everybody's good at expressing themselves, so that, that, that could be a reason where they're looking out for the student. But I'm going to say, unfortunately, most of the time, if that's coming up, from my experience, it's come from a place of ego of trying to retain that student, of trying to, to corral them, or because of a, a personal belief that what they're teaching is the best thing and thus the only thing they should spend their time on. Yeah, I think it's a sense of ownership that I really like push back against. Yeah. Um, but it's because you're a rebel. Russ says thanks. Yay! No doubt. I also I like just to add to your comment if I can. Um, is just that you have to be a certain amount of proficient before you do dabble in other arts. Yeah. Um, so I'll say that too. Like yeah. your 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 instructor shouldn't say you should have to ask my permission. But I believe that there might be a communication like I'm going to go do this. Sure. And. There should, there should be no ownership over you. But totally. that's how I feel about that. Um, okay, so in line with your goals, um, I want to know how you, how do you plan to make martial arts more prominent in the United States? I want to make martial arts cool. Okay, <laughs> I think I'm pretty I mean, cool. That's, that, that's, that's the heart of it. Like, that's the one sentence. Like, that's the one sentence goal of how Whistlekick will have the impact that it's going to have is to make martial arts cool. I, I reflect back on being a teenager, you know, so like I started at four and, you know, like we've already talked about the idea that, you know, lots of kids do martial arts and then they hit like 10, 11, 12, maybe a little bit older and they're like, ah, I'm going to go play soccer. I'm going to play basketball. I'm going to do whatever because they see a path forward. They see it on TV. They see it in the Olympics. They, 
They can name people that are making a bunch of money doing it. They have uh, T-shirts or sweatshirts or or whatever that represent it. Um, the the quote unquote flag that you can fly to tell the world I play this sport. And as martial artists, when I was a kid, we definitely didn't have that. We had Bruce Lee T-shirts. You know, maybe you had a T-shirt from your martial arts school. Mm -hmm. But there was never anything that if somebody saw you walking down the street, they would say, that person does martial arts. Unless you're, like, doing something weird walking down the street. You could wear a Bruce Lee t-shirt, but so could anybody else. And that's that's the goal with Whistle Kick. That's why we'll never do an, a line of MMA stuff. Because there are plenty of brands that do MMA stuff. Yeah. And there are brands that make Whistle Kick equipment. Or, I'm sorry, traditional martial arts equipment. But the difference here, the, the difference with Whistlekick is we're focused on the content of, of the company. We're focused on, excuse me, this podcast. If, if you took a look at where I spent my time during the week, 25% of what I do is related to this podcast. As a percentage of, of sales and, and marketing relating directly to selling gear, which is still our bread and butter, it's still 90 eight percent of sales i don't put a lot of time into that mm -hmm. i put the time into into the content there are other things that are, are on the verge of, of popping out you know new forms of content they're completely unrelated to this podcast because as we can build some some unity some synergy i can say hey whistle kick we make shirts for martial artists mm. not shirts for people that do karate Right, become like the sparring arts, so to speak. Because like Aikido isn't is not really a sparring art. No, there are like like offshoots of it, but like so I think Aikidoka would have a really hard time, you know, identifying with whistle kick. For but you aim maybe, to like maybe now, but that. ultimately, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the only reason that that the sparring gear was the first thing to come out is because that's what I knew I could make a, a big impact with first, right. because that was the biggest hole in the market was a quality foam gear and then there's i mean there's so much stuff in development you know in various stages you know if you go on my desk right now there's half a dozen prototypes so do you plan to like make you know make martial arts cool again by like uh, say um uh, uh supporting other martial artists i mean whether they're com you know sparring and competing um do you plan to say um sponsor certain artists not just for their competition and their sure but for Ab their, absolutely their... you know and, and... <sighs> You know, there, there are certain things I'm not going to talk about because they're, they're right there. St starts to ride the edge of, of trade secret, but sure. um, I want to help everyone succeed in whatever their goal is. And obviously, I can't do that for literally everyone. Right. But you know, I see no reason why Whistlekick can't sponsor an Aikido seminar series, or you know. Um, or or Qigong, <laughs> or you know, um, you know, next year at the at the U.S. Sumo Open that yeah, sumo. you know I can't help you know make make that a a, a broader event or, or or to you know I want martial artists I want I want karate people to look at kendo and say. That's really cool, and I want kendo people to look at taekwondo and say that's really cool, and I want us to 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 stand together because if we look at martial arts in this country, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't have the breakdowns quite so much in, in internationally, but in the U.S. we have half the participation of traditional martial arts that the world does globally. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, and when when we think about doing martial arts as a child is an is such a common experience that it's cliche. Yeah, kind of is. And yet we 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 lose that somewhere on the along the way. And I just and I want to stem that tide because if we have more people training and we make martial arts cool, we start bringing in money from outside. And the basic goal of any economy, the first step is to stop the money from going out, and the second step is to bring money in from the outside. Mm -hmm. If the only time a martial artist makes money is from another martial artist, 
if I'm handing you five bucks and you hand it right back, then the yeah, only, right. only one that's winning is the IRS. Right. So, I mean, do you think that there's a lack of relevance, that, or people do not find relevance as they age out of uh, martial arts as a child? I don't, wanna, I don't, I don't want to go there. Okay. I don't want to go there because that, that's, a, that's a deep rabbit hole and I want to make sure we right, tackle we'll those, those, those other things. So I think one of the questions was, tell us about the, well, I feel like that's a big question, but I want to know about your, the time you had a school. Yeah, I just have to. All right, so we can talk about that. So, okay. um, you know, I, I, moved, I moved to Vermont and I was living in a, in a little town called Randolph, Vermont, which is uh, pretty much smack in the middle of the state. It was supposed to be the state capital, but uh, for some reason it became Montpelier and I forget why, but... Um, there was a, uh, a gym, Sean, please, uh, there was a, a gym right near my house that had a couple dance rooms and I, and they weren't teaching any martial arts and I'd received permission from my instructors to, to teach if I wanted. And, uh, and so I went in and I was like, Hey, I teach karate. And they're like, that's cool. You want to teach karate here? I was like, yeah. So I taught karate for about two years. And I think at the peak, there was one class, I, one adult class, I had 28 people show up, which was way too many for the space and for my own ability to run a class. And so it shrunk back down. Um, but I was averaging anywhere from 15 to 20 towards, you know, at the, at the height. Uh, kids class was like 8 to 10. And it was cool. It was fun. Like, by the time the gym got paid out and everything, I wasn't making any money. And that was fine. I wasn't doing it for money. Um, there aren't a whole lot of martial artists that are teaching for money and actually uh, making money. As we covered. <laughs> right. Right. It is, it is not the easiest way to make a buck. No. That's for sure. Um, so crinkly out there. <laughs> I know. Sean's hungry. He didn't get to have dinner. Are you eating those chips? Oh, another one of those bars. Yeah, a couple of chips. Buddy. RX bars, RX bars are super good. RX bar, send send me some bars because I've turned so many people onto those things. Um, and I ran it pretty much the way my original karate school was run. Like I didn't do too much differently. You know, there are a couple of small changes I made, but you know, in in we always tested slow. You know, like people had to be really competent and and. Um, I found ways to motivate people other than rank that that worked pretty well and like what I uh, just you know, encouragement you know just verbal verbal rewards the recognition that that people want to be praised and if the only time the only way you're praising them is putting a stripe or a, a different color around their waist then you're dropping the ball as an instructor yeah, yeah. you know if if I mean, there are going to be people that are going to associate that belt as as their accomplishment. That, that rank is the only thing that matters, and you, and you can't you can't save everybody from that. But if the only if, if you find the majority of your students or a large portion of your students are coming to you and saying, "I'm going to test or I'm going to leave," well, you're 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 messing up. You're screwing something up. I agree. Yeah. I so. Uh, so I did that for two years from like age 22 to 24, right about there. Mm -hmm. uh, it was fun. I learned a lot from it. I learned so much in those two years that there were times I was teaching things and I would, I would stop. I would go, oh, that's what they were trying to show me. Yes. Like these moments yeah. of, you know. When you teach, you learn so much. Close to 20 years of training later going, <laughs> it's, it makes so much sense now. How did I miss that? Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that was fun, and that's one of the reasons I think teaching is so important, even if it's, you know, assistant instructing. And I, and I know some schools where that's a required part of their curriculum, curriculum that you, at a certain rank, you have to start helping to teach. And some people see it as like, oh, well, you know, they're just trying to, you know, steal my, my time and, and make money off of me. But And maybe some schools do it for that reason, but I, I think, it, you know, you if you think you know something, try teaching it. Yeah. You know, it is such a different ball game. I completely agree. It makes you more versatile. Yeah. Yeah, yeah without a doubt. Because different people learn in different ways. Yep. That's something that, that really, uh, my, my training in CrossFit, my coaching in CrossFit really helped me to understand is that sometimes you got to teach it in a different way. And in martial arts, we don't always uh, accept that, that people learn differently. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. If 
feel like if you're pressured to teach something, you're so much more pressured to learn it. Are you on camera? Mm-hmm. You're uh, talking, you're on camera. Sean. Yeah, so I feel like if you have to teach something, you learn it better. Yeah. And you want, you're more passionate about it, and you feel like you have to know, like there's no, uh, maybe I can get by, you have to know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and there's, it's it's been organized in, in a certain way, like this, um, this concept, if you truly want to understand something, you... You hear it, you demonstrate it, you repeat it back, and then you teach it. Yeah. You know, I, I, and I, I may be botching no, I mean, that organization of, of, of it, but that's the pinnacle is the ability to teach it back to somebody else. So speaking of learning, like, so tell us about the Superfoot. Okay. Um, so the Superfoot test is unlike the other black belt tests that I've been involved in, in that it covers a much smaller body of material than people would ever imagine. So in the Superfoot system, which at its heart is kickboxing, um, can one of you grab the certificate off my bedroom wall? It's this wall, please. Um, I meant to grab that and forgot. Um, you've got to know how to do the stance, you know, the basic sideways stance, and a couple elements of footwork, three kicks, four punches, that's it. <laughs> but you've got to demonstrate your ability to use them and combine them. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> and it's hard. Like, you know, the, the best way I explain Superfoot is it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. You know, I could say, jump 20 feet in the air. That's a simple concept, but it's not easy. Mm-hmm. And that's, the challenge that that most people have with it is that you know and and further like you have to have a a a black belt prior to testing like it's not that you can just step in as a white belt and black belt in anything or like no i'm not a superfoot school owner so i don't i I don't know i just um i wonder why there's that requisite but anyway uh, demonstrating a time it's it's like a it's like a black belt addendum, you know. It's like a okay, okay, okay. Like an academy accessory. Yeah, yeah. For prior black belts. Uh-huh. In a way. Uh, it's a specialization. Might be might be a way to think of it. Um, and the tests are not super long, but they're really hard. You know. So it's a precision a- thing. Hour and a half, two it's hours, hard. and you kick like the whole time, mm-hmm. like the whole time. You know, sometimes your foot is off the ground for minutes and you're kicking. Wow. Do we have any footage of this? No. Damn. No. <laughs> no. No, we, we talked about it. There is no footage. And, and, oh, bummer. Um, I actually am trying to get him to bring me with him. We. Stop. Um, I'm trying to get Jeremy to bring me with him because he posted something on his Facebook. Very big, uh, you know, thanks. And we saw Terry Dow. And I was like, I said to my master, I was like, did Jeremy get a second degree uh, through Bill Wallace? He's like, you know what? I think so, but I don't know. <laughs> That's what I was like, Jeremy, where are all the videos? And he's so humble that he, he's not going to post anything like that. So I'm like, uh, Jeremy, bring me with you. I'll take them because people really want to see this. Well, um, some tests are very private. Yeah, and th- yeah. this isn't quite that, but the idea of filming may, may, not, be, may not be accepted. But if you want to go down uh, to New Hampshire uh, for, the, for the seminar... Um, Paul's going to test in November so I can I can sneak you in you can watch that test that would be great yeah. no video but you can watch it alright and uh, um, we can talk about it and, yeah and uh, really put a little bit more of it into your show maybe do a follow up show about uh, so yeah Bill Wallace's testing. yeah so what, what's really interesting about about Superfoot is that everybody that I've seen come into the system has some piece whether it's the footwork or the kicking or the boxing because remember bill wallace was a kickboxer you know so yeah you had to kick but ultimately you get within kicking distance so you got to learn how to punch and and as he says i learned how to box for two reasons one to keep you off of me so i could kick you and two so i could keep you off of me so i could kick you right great yeah it's pretty simple very simple right (laughs) simple but it's not easy do you want me to switch out with you? I actually got to leave soon. So, oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Um, I'm away from bathing. Yeah. Um, I have no sense. So whether it's, it's the footwork or the boxing or the kicking or the kicking endurance or the flexibility, you know, people are, are everybody I've seen is, has been falling down in one way or the other. For me, it was, it was the handwork. Okay. You know, I, I, even though I came from a karate school originally, I didn't, I didn't have the hands you know, I, I, when I, when I competed, people thought I was a Taekwondo practitioner because of my kicks. I've always been a kicker. That's just, you know, I'm small, I'm fl- I have flexible hips and I, you know, if I'm in w- within range to punch somebody with the assumption that everyone is taller than me, cause almost everyone is taller than me, they can punch me back. So if I could kick them, then maybe they, they couldn't punch me back. It's very reasonable. Like, right. Like yeah, that's just, that's, super, that's, like... that's how I developed. Yeah. So, um, and so here I just thought is. I'd, so I don't know how close we, we are getting here, but what's interesting about this is even though um, Grandmaster Wallace is very... I can't see it with the glare. Okay, Better. well... Oh. Hold it up a little higher. Yep, perfect. So even though he's very um, approachable, like he, even for his episode, even though I didn't even know him then, he wanted me to call him Bill. I'm bringing it closer. All right, I'm going to hand this to, to, to Kimberly, and she's going to put it where you tell Bring her to. Bring it right up to the camera so people can take a look at it. It should autofocus. Uh, come this way? Yep. Okay. Uh, you can see there's Japanese on there. He's written my rank as Nidan. Um, you know, the moment we go into testing mode, he, you know, there's a lot of bowing. There's a lot of counting in Japanese. And it, it's, it's, I don't know, it's just interesting because if, if you watch a, a Superfoot seminar, there's, you know, there's not a lot of ceremony to it, but in superfoot testing, there is. You know, he's a he's an old Shorn Rue guy. You know, he's. I can put that back. Okay. So. Cool. Does that answer your your questions adequately around around testing, Sean? I know that was an important one for you. Actually, yeah, uh, it does answer some questions, but I really think the best way to answer is to see it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm I'm not. The the space here is now. not set up for for demonstration. Pleasure One of the for. things that I'm very aware of that that I want to do more of with Whistle Kick is is video, yeah. but to set up video for myself uh, is a pain in the butt. So uh, don't worry, it's, it'll happen someday in the future. In the future. Oh, and and here's a good time. Just so if anybody's new, uh, so we've got the episode 200 commemorative uh, bracelet. bracelet cuff. Thing, thanks to Alex, and you can check that out at whistlekick.com. And it's ten dollars off through when I wake up tomorrow because I'm not going to go online and change it tonight because I'm already tired. Um, and then I'll leave the ordering page up for a, a few days if people want to order it. But it's a collaboration with a local artist who does really good work, and, and um, the rubber is recycled bike inner tube. So that's cool. You're not damaging the environment, I don't think. Do you get one? So I just want to. Uh-huh. I'm gonna pop on camera and, All right. say, and say good night. But I, there's something that I'd like to say about what you've done with this show and what it's done for me as a martial artist. I've been studying for you, about ten years. Are you on camera? I am on camera. Oh, nice job. So, so, um, yeah, he was quick with that. Yeah, he's so, good. He's getting good. <laughs> so it, you're hired. It sort of harkens back to the question about making martial arts cool again, and for me. Um, the only martial art, martial art I've ever known is a blended style, which is very different from many people. Yeah. Um, so for me, I have this very broad mindset of martial arts already, but there are still some things that, there were still some walls there. And something that Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio has done is exposed me really in depth, because you get to know, it attaches it to a person. Mm. We've, we've heard personal stories from so many people, from so many different arts, and they've they've just sort of like not even knocked the walls down, but basically they just disappeared mm. because you make a connection that's 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 different from you're not knocking down a wall because you just talk you you hear what a person has to say about their experience about their um, their path, mm. and and for me, I never really thought about studying other styles because I studied a bunny style that's pretty well balanced as far as it does weapons, it does ground fighting, it does stand up fighting, it does a little bit of everything, but there's still things that we don't do. 
and there's other, and there's people that do other things, and and so th there's and I found that every martial art has its own sort of doctrine, and what will make martial arts cool again is that people forget about that doctrine and ideology that's so strong, and just as you've said in so many episodes, think about the things that we have in common, make those bridges, yeah. because it's just been for me I've I've experienced a normal personal growth, enormous personal growth in that particular area, being able to um, see those connections and and instead of just looking at the connection, actually reaching out and trying to pull it towards me. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. a, Thanks, I'm going to say goodnight to everybody. It was fun to good be here for episode 200. I appreciate um, it. It was fun to episode, it's an You're, interview for, yeah, for 100. Episode 100. Yeah, episode 100. Um, I referenced that before you got here. Yeah, yeah. So yeah he was the one that I, I put on the other side of the table. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, it's it's funny because we're better friends because of this show. Yep. You know, absolutely. and not just episode 100, but I, I it just, I don't know, I just I feel like that. I remember the hype train before you launched it. The hype train, you're like, we're going to launch it, we're going to do this thing, I'm going to try it, we're going to see how it goes. And I also want to attest that how much you've grown as a host from those first episodes yeah. to now, you, you're yeah. really just doing a, a, a great job with the show. Thank you've you. You've really grown a lot. Thanks, man. Give the give the baby a, give the baby a, yeah. a whatever a pat. Yeah, we're also closing on the house on Friday. So, yeah, I know it's a big so week. We're, we're packing. We're I'm singing an acapella group. We're doing all this other stuff. So, yeah, busy week. Awesome. All right, bye. I'm glad I could share this with yeah. the 100 yeah. episode. Yeah. Um, okay, so do we all have right. enough time What's, to talk about your favorite episode? Group. Speaking of. Yeah, yeah. So let's let let's let's talk about that. So. You know, as as Sean and I were, were prepping and, and sat down a couple times to talk about what was going on and and what what episodes were important and subjects and ever everything he asked me, he said, you know, what's what's your favorite episode? And I just kind of started rattling off, and probably five ten minutes later, he's like, okay, you need to talk about that on the show. And for me, it, it's it's Fumio Demaro's, which is episode one thirty, and and the whole the story behind that one is is really cool to me because it's so different. Episode 109 was a profile of Fumio Demura because I was told I would never get him on the show. So I did a profile, you know, I did all the research and put that together and it was cool, you know, I learned some stuff and whatever. And then the next thing I know, I am get I get a notification on Facebook that the real Miyagi, the documentary on Fumio Demura featured the podcast episode because you know they're always looking for stuff about Demura sensei to share to for their facebook page so they're like hey people you may want to check this out and i was like wow so i wrote him a message and i was like thanks i really appreciate you doing that uh and they're like oh you're welcome thank you you know we just passed a number of messages back and forth and and i said you know if there's ever the opportunity to talk to him yeah. you know just just let me know what i could do you know, and I was expecting, well, you know, um, he only does in-person interviews and when, and I, and I would have booked a plane ticket. Like I would have flown to California. I would have given up three, four days of my life to, to have an interview with him. I was totally down for that. But they wrote back and said, we'll see what we can do. Cool. <laughs> and like two hours later, I got an e I got a message that said, here's his email address. <laughs> and I went, this can't be real. So I just, I wrote, you know, Demaro Sensei, uh, the folks at the Real Miyagi documentary gave me this email address. Um, and in fact, I may have even worded it that it wasn't going directly to him. You know, might have been right. like to somebody that knew him or something. Uh, would love to talk about having an interview. And like 30 minutes later, Jeremy... Nice to hear from, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, nice to hear from you. Uh, would love to do an inter interview. Let me know when. Fumio. And I was Woo! like, what? <laughs> I, 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 not only is it because it's a family show, but there's kids in the room. I, I will not repeat what my response was, but <laughs> whoa. So uh, it took us about a week to set it up. And I knew, I knew, yeah, if you're going to drink from that, don't do that near the mic, please. Um, and I knew that this was going to be a big deal, 
right? So like normally I will start getting ready for an episode 15 minutes before. No, you were ready like... The, like yesterday. two hours. It was like two <laughs> hours before I was like, all right, uh, let's check all the gear. Okay, let's check it again. Let's check it again. Um, let's... T- like I'm, I'm walking around the house unplugging things that have nothing to do with the internet. You know, like, like I'm, I'm, fe- I'm, like I'm, I'm plugging the cat, like just, like anything and everything that could have the most remote impact, yeah, was dealt with. And anybody that's listened to that episode know that knows that it, it wasn't always easy to understand. You know, he's got, he's, despite living here for so long, he's got a very thick accent, and there were t- there were times that were a little bit difficult. To- to understand him but it was just so powerful it just you know the 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 closest thing i can relate it to is i saw the dalai lama speak in central park when i was in college okay. and i didn't understand a word he said and i barely understood the translator but there was so much power so much energy his presence yeah. from from his presence from him just being there and that was similar to what i was experiencing talking to Demaro Sensei. It was, it was unlike anything else I'd experienced. And when we were done, you know, the call ended and I made sure it was backing up immediately. And I just felt myself getting really emotional. Because this guy's one of, it's one of the guys, right? Like if, if you... That just happened. Kind of like, like, yeah, like that just happened. You know, if you think about, if you know his history, you know that he was, you know, the two things that he really is responsible for in the United States is, is promoting the use of weapons and promoting mar- the martial arts demonstration the way it is it is done now. Mm-hmm. And from demonstrations, that spread martial arts so much. And would it have happened eventually? Sure. But he was the guy that started it. Yeah. And who knows when it would have happened otherwise because it was kind of flying in the face of some traditions. But I, I pulled out my phone and, and started recording and, and just because I, I, I knew I knew I was having a moment I, that I wanted to reflect on. And, and I put it out on YouTube like right away. I was like, this is what just happened. Is it still out there? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, because I don't generally like I'll I'll censor my my words, but not my not so much my emotions. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So um, I want to let you know that you have about twenty five minutes left. Okay. And um, I also want to uh, you can you don't have to get in depth on this, but we talked about so much about your favorite episode. I want to know what your second favorite episode was. And um, and then, like I said, there's 25 minutes left. So anything you can think about that you want to get in this? What was what was our what was the other question? Because there were four, and I feel like we got to that was three. School, superfoot testing, the two Demera, super tests. and what was that fourth one, Sean? That you wanted? Uh, she's got it. I have uh, four of them with little circle bullets on them. Yeah, I mean, we talked about your goals. We talked about from you tomorrow. We talked about two superfoot tests, and okay. we talked about yeah. I guess we, I guess we did talk about goals. Um, <clears throat> We any any emails? Any new emails? Okay. New emails. No? Okay. Uh, Instagram still running? Okay. Yes, it is. Cool. Can I get up for a second? Yeah, go. Go. This is... Do you want to maybe ask them a question about what they think about martial arts as kids real quickly? Sure. Hi. Hi. What's going on, Noelle? I don't know. I'm suppo- I, you're supposed to ask me questions. I'm supposed to ask you? What martial art do you practice? Taekwondo. What do you like about Taekwondo? I like how there's um there's not too many people like in our class. There's probably like the most we've had is like twenty five. Okay. So when we're working we all we get individual work as mm. well as group work because in some places that practice martial arts, like there's so many people that it's hard mm-hmm. for some people to get individual work and I really like that about art. Why 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 is that individual attention important to you? Because when you're learning as a group, you're kind of focusing on what everybody needs, not just what one person mm-hmm. needs, because everybody is in a different belt, so when they're so they're in a different level. 
So that just, that really, I like that about Taekwondo. Mm. And How old are you? 11. Mm. So, school owners. We're drawing, I think you can draw some correlations there to some of the subjects we were talking about earlier. So, cool. Thank you. All right. Swap out. Jacoby, go, why don't you go this way? No. All right, Jacoby, come this way. You guys are freaking me out going that way because, like, I set that up with all the cords and everything. But, what's up? Not much. Not much? No. You do Taekwondo. Yeah. What do you like about Taekwondo? I like every single kick, honestly. You like kicking. What do you like about kicking? I like how it feels when you hit the bag. Like, mm. it makes a loud noise. Like. Mm. You like making that noise. Mm -hmm. You're not a quiet child, are you? No. No, no, he's not a quiet child. No. Not historically. Not historically. <laughs> That's that. I like that answer. Okay. What else do you like about Taekwondo, other than making noise? It's I it's like kind of a safe that. place to make noise. I like that right you can time. meet new friends and okay. the ranks of belts. What do you like about belts? Like, I like going, like, higher and higher in the rank. Okay. What does that mean to you, to be a higher rank? Like, I'm getting better every day. Mm. Okay. See, and that's, and, that, and that's one of the keys that we've talked about tonight, too, is the idea that that, that rank should correlate with, with effort and skill, not, just, not as a reward. Mm -hmm. So, and that's cool. Awesome. Do you see a time when you're done with taekwondo or do you think you'll keep going i think i'll keep going till at least black belt probably mm -hmm. higher okay good i hope that's true all right thanks for answering my questions all right i'm kicking you out okay uh one of the things i that i wanted to do okay one of the things that i wanted to do is i wanted to to show a few of the books because we've had a ton of books from uh, guests on the show. So like, here's one. This is from, um, Mr. Kevin Hudson. Okay. Uh, this is, this is, you can hit the mark, which is, which is a great book. And I, I read this, um, I don't read a lot of books and my friends know that. And if you listen to the show, you, excuse me, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for books, but I don't, I don't have a ton of time. So I don't read a lot of books. If I quote unquote read, it's often an audio book. I read this book. It's incredibly personal, really, really good book. Um, and unlike a lot of people who have a strong sense of faith that write, this is not an overly religious book. So uh, uh, kudos to Mr. Hudson for, for managing to express his faith in a book along with martial arts in a way that was not, um, that I wouldn't expect to, to be off-putting to anyone. So this is from uh, someone named Scott Pribble, who's been on the show. And uh, if you've listened to his episode, you know that he had uh, a condition with his heart that not only should it have killed him, but he's, he's pretty much the only man documented to have survived his specific circumstances with that condition. So utterly crazy. Um, one of several books that uh, Mr. Damian Lupo sent. Uh, I have not listened to, uh, listen, I have not read this one yet, but... Uh, I really enjoyed my time talking with him. And, and he, to my knowledge, is in Vermont now, to, like still today, and we just didn't get to connect. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, no, I've got my copy like somewhere over here. And then um, if you listen to the Grandmaster June Re episode, he said, I'm going to send you a book. And he did. And here it is. And you can see that I'm working on it because I've got like seven books I'm working on right now. But this is a, an incredibly positive, optimistic book that uh, is worth checking out. And then uh, saving the, the, I'll be honest, my favorite one for last. Uh, this is The Killing Art by Mr. Alex Gillis. And I loved reading this book. This is the second edition. And um, he wrote something in here, and, I, and I'll read it. It says, to Jeremy, thanks for all you do for our martial arts I wish you much success with your business. Um, it's such a fantastic book. And this is the second edition. And I just, I don't know. It's a great book. Whether or not you're a Taekwondo practitioner, it really is a great in-depth story on 
a specific period of time in martial arts. One of the things that I, I think is really cool about the history of Taekwondo is that it's recent enough that we know it all. You know, we talk about Taekwondo as being this ancient thing, and, and it's not. I mean, there, there are some influences that are older, but Taekwondo as it is now is not thousands of years old. It's decades, you know, somewhere around the 50s, depending on who you're, you're talking to as to when it congealed. But uh, prior to that, it was really karate. So um, there are books. Now, where's my topic list? Because I think we got a couple things left that I did not do. All right. Uh, we're going to save shout outs and thank yous for the very end because there are some people that I want to make sure that I thank. Come uh, sit over in the gym. Yeah, come sit. All right. Uh, one thing very quickly that we didn't talk about, um, or I don't think we talked about, was uh, the martial arts of paradox. We train to fight, um, but we try not to. Yeah, so I, I brought that subject up and I, and I find it really interesting. Stay, stay over on that side, please. Um, you know, we spend so much time, like, you know, every class, you know, all of our practices is, is under this, this concept of becoming better should you ever get into a fight. And, ah, Sorry. mute. I don't like hearing my own voice. It's weird. I have a weird voice. This is the point in the show where I get tired. I'm going to take a small tangent, then we're going to come back because this is kind of a fun tangent. So in college, I ran the school's TV station. I was I was basically given this TV station with all this equipment, tens of thousands of dollars of equipment, and said, here, there were no shows. There was zero content whatsoever. It was, I was, I was the, I was like, it was like being, being the, the prime minister of a country with no people. Well, must feel good you've got over 800 views here tonight so Sweet. far. And you know people are going to oh, watch it. But I'm not done. I'm not done. So uh, this was in the late 90s, and I said, what can I do? How do and, and I tried to get people to come on, the, come on the air. I was like, you should have a show. And everybody's like, no. And I was like, fine, I'll go first. Right around that time, I had, um, I had another, I had a, uh, there was a company that specialized in renting like first run movies, like just as they hit VHS, we're going back just as they hit VHS to be played on college TV stations, you know, like closed circuit networks. So we got that, we got some equipment in, and I ran those movies whenever I wasn't, when I was in class. The rest of the time I was on the air. I lived on the air for a week. I slept on the air. And every night for hours, Basically, from the time I got out of my last class, ate dinner until I couldn't do it anymore and I was going crazy, I recorded. I sat behind a desk. We took calls. And I, would, I probably did 20 to 25 hours of that kind of programming in that week. It was insane. And from there, we launched the show. Uh, I was recognized on campus. People told me about the weird positions I slept in at 3 in the morning. I asked them why they were watching me sleep because you were on TV. Um, so, yeah. Well, it shows. You do a great job. Well, and thanks. On behalf of all of your fans, um, you're great. You're doing something not a lot of people do, and we love it. Thanks. That's cool. Maybe for episode 300, I'll have a bigger house, and we'll bring everybody in. <laughs> yeah, from like a, you know, a really, really warm and tropical location. From a warm and tropical loca location, yes, you will. No, you know what? If I'm in a house in a warm and tropical location, we're gonna be, in Florida. We're gonna be there too. Oh, Florida! Yeah. Florida doesn't. Florida doesn't like me. Anyway, anyway, um, so so Marshall Paradox. We spent all this time, you know, with all the fighting, and then, you know, the the other half of that. Don't fight. Don't fight unless you have to. Don't use it unless you have to. And it's. I don't think there's any better illustration of what martial arts is really for than that than that that conflict there why spend the time training to do something if you're not going to use it well obviously we're not warriors we're not you know we're, we're not i mean you served you were in the military you had a reason for learning that i mean a, a true reason you were far more likely to need that than the average person uh, 
one of my proudest accomplishments is I've never been in what I would call a fight. I've always been able to defuse it. There are a couple kind of close things, whatever, but they, they didn't really turn into fights. Because and, and that's not despite my martial arts training, but it's because of it. And I think that that in developing my skill well enough that I'm confident that should I get into a fight, I would fare well and probably win. My ego is such that I I I will back down. I don't care who it is, I'll back down. You know, if some you know, if some fourteen year old punk kid confronts me on the street and wants to what what am I gonna what do I have to gain? You know, I have I have nothing to gain there. And it's that that paradox I think in the end really isn't a paradox. I think it's intentional. And I think you've got to really be able to see and see beyond that for it to make sense. Great answer. Great answer, Jim. Thanks. I'm going to go. Okay. You go. All right. Uh, when there's five minutes left, let me know. We're going to do shout outs. <laughs> wow. I think we've. Okay. Psychological weather has. All right. I don't want to talk about topics. I don't want to talk about these things because that's really what we've been doing most of the evening. I want to talk about, I just kind of want to go off the cuff here. I want to talk about stuff that's important to me. Um, I want to, the challenge for me here is that I'm tired because it's late. So I'm not at my best, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm not misspeaking because if I misspeak on these subjects, I might say wrong things. Okay. Um, I love what I do. I really do. I love whistle kick. Uh, please don't practice your balance next to chords. Okay. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick both of you guys over to there. Okay. Because your dad's going to have to do some stuff and I want him to be unencumbered. Um, I love whistle kick. I love what I do. I love, I love this show. I love this show in a way that I didn't think I would. Um, okay. Is the cat okay? Yeah. The one was trying to pet her. Okay, just leave the cat alone, please, guys. She's she's okay. overwhelmed. Actually. Um. But it's not easy. You know the idea that. Um, this is not a 40 hour a week job. Um, anybody that's owned their own business understands that it takes a lot, it takes a lot of work to, to get somewhere. And if we, my last business was a service business. I had a pretty clearly defined demographic market. You know, anybody that had computers in this geographic area, you know, so how did I reach them? I took out newspaper ads and radio ads and put up posters and incentivized word of mouth stuff. But whistle kick's different. For the first couple of years, I mean, for over two years, whistle kick was selling product and there was no podcast. And there were very, very few sales. I would go to some events and there was some success coming from those, but it wasn't growing. And one of the challenges we've talked about, you know, my goal to kind of bring martial arts together and to, to bring a bit of unity. There was no place I could just throw money and reach everyone. You know, I tried Facebook ads. I threw a ton of money at Facebook ads. It didn't turn into anything. Um, I advertised in the few remaining martial arts magazines, martial arts websites. And there's so, there are so few people that that reaches that I had to come up with something else. So the podcast here is really an attempt to build a platform that serves all martial artists. And I know we have people that don't even train that watch this show or listen to this show. Now, oh, see, I got my words flipped down. And that's awesome. I, I love that people find some inspiration or some entertainment in the stories 
that we've got going here. But now that there's the platform, Whistlekick gets to ride on top of it. And I think that that's pretty cool. And so the other content that we're doing is gonna be along those lines. But in a sense, it's kind of, there is, there is an artistic element to this show. And my, my definition of art, um, some people have heard me say this, maybe not on the show, but art is that which you create and you leave a piece of your soul. And there are, there are days, there are weeks where I'm exhausted. It's hard. And, and I, and I uh, there was an episode. Oh, yeah, it was the episode from when I came back from, um, from Alabama, from the Superfoot test. That, that Thursday episode it was a disaster. It, it was bad enough I considered not putting it out. And I don't know that I'm embarrassed by it, but it was not it was not up to snuff because I was so tired because Delta decided that delaying my flight sixteen times was appropriate. Literally sixteen times. I'm not I'm not exaggerating. Um, here, have a two hundred dollar credit on a future flight. Thanks, Delta. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, I'll do that in a second. Um but I'm always going to give what I have to the show, to the other content, to the people that, did that die? To, I'm going to give what I have to the people that are, are taking value in it, whatever form that may be. Because I take what I'm doing seriously. You don't have to listen. You don't have to watch. And the fact that you do, I take a lot of responsibility for that. You know, I'm, I'm, I put seven, eight hours just today into preparing for this show. Um, and probably half a dozen hours prior, you know, setting up gear and testing it and meetings with Sean and emails and all the other conversations that we had related to it. And... Could it have been better? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Could have been a lot worse. Uh, thank God I have, you know, years of experience of rambling to make this happen. Um, but I want to. Th I want to thank everybody. I want to thank everybody for tolerating me when I'm not at my best. And I want to thank you for your feedback. And I want to thank you for. The comments and the criticism that honestly make me better. Uh, that doesn't mean that you should beat me into the ground with it because I can only get so much better at, 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 at one time. But thank you. It means a lot. The logo. Let's talk about the logo. Never subtle. Um, and what I refer to as the double arc logo. So one of the things that was important to me with the logo for, for Whistlekick is that it could work at any, any size with any color combination and that it be simple. If you think about the logos for the most prominent sports companies, they're really simple. You know, you could put a Nike swoosh, you know, really tiny or you can make it huge. You can make it any color. It works on a hat, it works on a shoe. Under Armour, Reebok, Puma. There's others, I'm blanking. But if you look at all of those successful sportswear companies, they have something simple. And so I worked with a professional logo design firm and, and those were my criteria. I said it has to be, has to work for any size, has to work at any color, and it has to be simple and, and be recognizable without words. And if you compare it to something like Under Armour and Nike, you can see some similarities in there because there's only so many ways that you can draw shapes. Uh, I didn't want it, to, you know, like Puma with, has an actual Puma. I didn't want, you know, some of the initial logos that came back were of someone actually kicking, and I didn't want that because 
to me that's just um, too on the nose. Just a little bit on yeah. how you created the name Whistle Kick okay. in and in, in um, the logo, and we also have five minutes. Okay, I am not going to talk about talk publicly about the name because it has to do with a product that did not happen. Um, the research and development on on something that I want to do was expensive, so it's on hold. I still hope to do it, so I'm not going to say it uh, because um, we have attracted the attention of the larger competitors. I know at least two of the big three are very open about being on the email list. I don't know how often they open because I don't drill in that much because I don't care that much. There's really no secret to our success. It's make the best products we can, have the best podcast we can. Every, you know, to, to me, the logo is, symbolizes quality. You know, I, I want to make sure that now into the future, if you buy something that says whistle kick on it, you know it's going to be good. You know, maybe you don't like it or maybe it doesn't fit you right or something, but you know that all have made sure that it's the best we can make it or at least it's really good. Okay. All right. We're starting to wind down. I, I, I want to thank everybody. There are some people I want to thank specifically first. So, you know, obviously, first off, Sean, thank you. Thank you for giving up your time. And, and Noella and Jacoby, I want to thank you guys for, for being so good and quiet and hanging out and playing board games in my bedroom and, and whatever. You guys are good kids. So thanks. Uh, I want to thank Daniel for stopping by. I want to thank Kimberly for stopping by. Appreciate that. Um, I want to thank all the past guests. I'm not going to rattle down that list because that's a long list and we would run out of time. But I'm very aware that every one of those people that has come on the show gave up their time. They don't pay. Um, they also don't pay to come on the show. That neither of the money will never change hands for that. That's important to me. Uh, I, I try to give back where I can. In in you know if they've got a book or a website or something, you know we try to pump that as much as as much as we can because you know let's face it, we've all got to make a buck somewhere. And for those people that are earning money through martial arts, which we've already established is not easy to do, you know, if I can lend them a little bit of support, you know, personally or, or, or encourage you all to do so, I'm going to do that. Uh, somebody that, that figures in really, really strongly that we very rarely talk about because my relationship with her is not simple is my mother. Uh, it was my mother that got me into martial arts, my mother that instilled this work ethic in me and set the bar really high. So I want to thank her for that. And I want to thank my original instructors, Beth and John Belot, for setting me on this path and, and in hindsight being some of the best martial artists that I've ever worked with. And if it wasn't for their skill teaching and their um, support and, and passion in working with me and so many others, I wouldn't be here, just flat out. I, I do not... I don't see this path happening without them being at the beginning, to be honest. And and I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of you for tuning in, whether it was in part or in full, whether you're watching it later or you're watching it live now. Uh, if you've listened or watched one episode or no episodes prior or every single one, know that that means a tremendous amount to me. I don't look at the download numbers every day, but I do look at them. And I've said it before, if it wasn't for all of you, I would just be some crazy guy talking to a microphone. So thank you for making me feel like I'm not completely crazy and giving me the opportunity to share some time with you once in a while, a couple times a week, whatever, however it fits into your life. And thanks a lot for being part of episode 200. Have a great night, and I'll talk to you all soon. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Jeremy, for the opportunity. Thanks, it was once, uh, once a lifetime thing. That's right. I appreciate it.